Okay. All right, uh, we have reconvened from closed session, and I have the following announcements. By a 5 to 0 vote, the City Council authorized and directed the City Attorney's Office to defend the cases of Rogers versus Elk Grove Police Department and Bahadri versus City of Elk Grove, as identified by the case number on the City Council meeting agenda. With that, we will adjourn the special meeting at 6.01 p.m. And uh, at this time, I'll call to order the Elk Grove City Council regular meeting. Today is Wednesday, December the 13th, 2023, and it is 6.01 p.m. Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. This meeting of the Elk Grove City Council will be cablecast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T U-verse cable systems. Meeting is closed caption and webcast at metro14live.seccounty.gov. Tonight's meeting replays will be on Friday, December 15th at 1 p.m. and Tuesday, December 19th at 1 p.m. as well on Channel 14. Previous meetings can be viewed online at www.elkgrovecity.org or youtube.com com slash, uh, backward slash Metro Cable 14. For members of the participating audience who may have personal electronic devices, please place them on silent mode during the meeting or on mute when you are not speaking. Elk Grove City Council welcomes, appreciates, and encourages participation in the City Council meeting. City Council requests that you limit your presentation to three minutes per person so that all present will have time to participate. City Council reserves the right to reasonably limit the total time for public comment on any particular notice agenda item as it may deem necessary. Pursuant to resolution number 2010-24, no individual speaker concerning public comment may address the City Council for more than three minutes. If you wish to address the council during the meeting, please complete a blue speaker card, which can be found at the back of the chamber and provided to the deputy city clerk prior to consideration of the agenda item. With that, Mayor, I will move into the roll call. And the roll call will start with Council Member Robles. Present. Council Member Brewer. Present. Council Member Suen. Here. Vice Mayor Spees. Present. And Mayor Singh Allen. Here. All are present. All right, thank you. Next up is our land acknowledgement. We honor, respect, and acknowledge Elk Grove's first inhabitant, the Plains Miwok, who lived as sovereign caretakers of this land and these waterways since time immemorial. We commemorate and advocate for their descendants, the Wilton Rancheria tribe, the only federally recognized tribe in Sacramento County who endure because of the bravery, resiliency, and determination of their ancestors tribal members, and leaders. Next up, we have our Pledge of Allegiance. And if I can get our Vice Mayor to lead. Hand over heart, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next up, we have our moment of silence. All right, thank you. All right, next up, we have our special item, item 1A, selection of our vice mayor. Did you have any Indeed. announcements, sir? Uh, all it is is this is prescribed by the Norms and Procedures Manual of the City Council. It's one of the first actions that we take with our meeting in December um, of each year is to select the vice mayor amongst the number of the council to serve going on into the future. We can replace and switch seats if you so wish to do so uh, right after the selection of vice mayor is made. In the past, the council has uh, made selections to just say that it uh, the process will continue into the next meeting. Um, so we have either option. We're ready and poised to go. We have placards ready at, and ready to go. All and right, very good. I will be making a nomination, but before that, I'll open up the public comment opportunity. I don't see anyone signed up on this item. I'll close the public comment opportunity. And it is my pleasure um, as mayor to make the recommendation to select Council Member Rod Brewer to be our next vice mayor. I gladly accept. I have a motion. Can I get a second? Second. second. Third. I have a motion and a second. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Congratulations, sir. Uh, would you like to say something? Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I definitely want to, want to thank uh, you, uh, Madam Mayor, and the council um, for your support. And I know it's the rotational um, motion that makes this happen, but um, I definitely enjoy serving the city of Elk Grove and serving um, the, the the council in being a representation, being the representation for our community, and 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 all the work that. Um, Vice Mayor Spees has done over the previous year and 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 Council Member Soon has done the previous year before definitely um, learned from them on how to handle business and to be um, and, and be responsive to the needs of, of our public and so I will definitely take that responsibility um, to the utmost and I look forward to um, serving you all in this new capacity but I am still Rod, by the way. <laughs> but, th but thank you so much. Um, it, it's, it's definitely an honor. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brewer. <laughs> and I see that your family is here um, as well. So we wanted to recognize and thank you for joining us this evening and the selection of Vice Mayor Rod Brewer. Thank you. All right, um, with that, we will move to our next agenda item, our approval of the agenda. With the caveat, I would like to make a recommendation that we hear 9.1 to be heard prior to the presentation of item 4.2. Um, and then we can uh, approve the remainder of the agenda items as presented. We do have a number of folks here for item 9.1, so I'd like to move that a little out of order. Second. Or so moved, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. I second. All, right, all, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Very good. All right, we will go ahead and move on to our 9.1. Clerk. Um, did you want to do that immediately for 9.1? We could jump into that, so. Um, what do we have? Okay, the closed session items, um, we have nothing to report out on that. We do have nothing on the closed sessions, whether you'd want to hear item 4.1 before that, so. Oh, I'm uh, sure, we, uh, yeah, yes, let's do 4.1 and that will be followed by 9.1. All right. And give time for, I think, a couple of people who want to be here for that item. So we'll ease our way back a little bit to uh, section four, our presentations and announcements, and that'll be item 4.1, which is a recognition of the Youth Mixed Martial Arts Championships 2023 Team USA participants and Certificate of Achievement for Gold Medalist, Cora Wadlington. All right, assisting in that presentation will be Council Member Darren Soon. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, it's my honor this evening uh, to recognize these individuals. Um, can I call Cora and uh, Adam and Adam Maldonado Jr. and Brooklyn Harper up to the podium? He's gonna come up. All right. As you're making way, your way up here, I, just at the risk of dating myself, I remember when uh, the mixed martial arts world just just seemed to start, and it's it's great to see how it's progressed uh, over the decades. And uh, not only that, but to see the amount of uh, um, young men and women involved in in this. Not to mention the fact that you have represented the best of, of Elk Grove. Uh, f throughout the uh, for our, our our nation as well at the 2023 Abu Dhabi United Emir Arab Emirates um, at, at the Youth Mixed Martial Arts Championships. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you on behalf of the City Council for doing that and congratulate all of you. Uh, whereas the 2023 uh, IMMAF International Mixed Martial Arts Federation. Youth MMA Championships for 12 to 17 year olds took place in Abu Dhabi, United uh, Arab Emirates from August 2nd through August 5th of this year. Whereas the capital city saw 42 nations from all corners of the globe, bringing an approximate number of 500 athletes to the event. That's incredible. Whereas the United States was represented by numerous athletes included and included competitors from the Sacramento region led by the gold medal effort of Cora Waldington and talents of team members Adam Maldonado Jr. and Brooklyn Harper. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Elk Grove hereby joins the community in recognizing the talent and teamwork of our regional 2023 IMMAF Youth MMA Championship competitors, commending the coaches, the families, and team members that displayed a collaborative spirit, building international goodwill as ambassadors in a competitive forum, 
and fostering the open, dependable, and progressive vision IMMAF has in supporting mixed martial arts competition uh, here this day, 13th of December, 2023. Congratulations to all of you. All right. We'd like to come take a photo with you, if you don't mind. I just want to say before, before yeah. this is awesome. Um, <laughs> congratulations. What color belts are you guys? Uh, I'm a green belt in jiu-jitsu. I'm a yellow black belt. All right. I'm a white belt in jiu-jitsu. All right, man. So, right, where do you guys roll? I got to come roll with you guys one of these days. Uh, legacy. legacy. Legacy? Legacy martial arts and Muay Thai. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'm going to get Councilman Suen to come out there, and we're going to go train with you guys. How about that? <laughs> so, Let's be gentle on them. <laughs> Please take it easy on us. We have to work the next day. <laughs> we'll be right down. All right, um, next is our item 4.2. And just prior to that, do we want to advance and hopscotch into 9.1, Mayor? Is everyone here from, I'm seeing a nod. Okay, yes, we will go on to 9.1. All right, and that's to consider a resolution in support of the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Good evening, council members. I'm here to make a present, uh, presentation oh. to adopt a resolution in support of the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. The Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, otherwise known as CEDO, is an international treaty that was adopted by the United um, Nations General Assembly in 1979 and signed the following year by President Jimmy Carter. And although this um, convention has been discussed at the committee level of the Senate, it has never come to the full Senate for consideration for a vote. The CEDAW provides a universal definition of discrimination against women and brings attention to various issues concerning women's rights or women's human rights. Although 189 countries have ratified the convention, the United States still has not done so. Consequently, it is not subject to um, CEDO obligations. The con uh, convention makes a definite um, definition of discrimination against women. As we can see up here, it clearly defines what qualifies as discrimination against women and seeks to promote the fundamental human rights of all women all over the world. The request for this resolution um, was made by the um, Sacramento County Commission 
on the status of women and girls based on the work of a group called Cities for CEDO. The commission, the Sacramento um, County Commission on the Status of Women and Girls, um, helps shape policy decisions and acts as a resource to advance economic opportunities and gathers um, data on the status of women and girls, among other duties. The commission um, identifies and works to eliminate issues affecting women and girls um, in the county. Recently, the um, commission requested that all cities in Sacramento County uh, requested for them to adopt a re um, resolution in support of CEDO. Um, I'm happy to say that the city of Sacramento passed a resolution on November 28th this year. And um, from information, the city of West Sacramento is currently working on passing its own resolution. So cities for CEDO, what, what do they do or who are they? So um, cities for CEDO is a national grassroots movement that promotes equity in local municipalities and counties and emphasizes equality and elimination of gender-based violence. So CEDO itself is the only international human rights that comprehensively, um, that is comprehensively and ded uh, completely dedicated to ending gender-based discrimination against women. The convention provides the basis for realizing equality between men and women through ensuring women's equal access to an equal op uh, opportunity in all sphere of life, including public life, political, name it. CEDO also accounts for um, taking appropriate measures against all forms of trafficking and exploitation of women. The CEDO Convention is based on three principles. One, non-discrimination. Two, state obligation. And three, substantive equality. Countries that ratify or are ceded to the Convention are legally bound to put the provision into practice. Because the U.S. has not ratified it, they are not bound by this. At this point, I would like to highlight that CEDO has many success stories. I just want to underscore a few. For example, inheritance rights in Tanzania. Um, before CEDO, women couldn't inherit anything. They, they were not in a pathway to inherit when something happens to even their parents. Only the males could. Now things have changed. In Turkey, we have um, the CEDO helping with the married uh, marriageable age that has now increased to 17. Before then, it could be any age for a, a girl child. Um, another one that I want to underscore is the landed property and also um, inheritability of women. That means when your uh, husband or you, your spouse passes, the woman becomes inheritable by the next by the next of kin. She gets. She's part of the property that is divided in Botswana. But things like that, uh, um, CEDO has helped to eliminate um, such occurrences. Um, going further, I will just want to talk about why adopt this resolution. What was the need for Elk Grove? Adopting this resolution will demonstrate the city is committed to protecting the fundamental human rights of women and girls within the city. And the city, the resolution itself is just for the city to review the recommendations and best practices of CEDO to determine what more we could do or what uh, we could do better in all our um, um, in all our efforts related to the rights of women and girls within the city of Elk Group, 
This review will help the city you know, take practical steps towards progress. Many cities uh, in California are taking very practical steps to promote um, equality and protect women's rights. If um, L Group signs this, passes this resolution, then we will be counted among them. Before I highlight this city, uh, the cities that are taking this, I mean, they have adopted this resolution, I want to comment I want to commend the city's diversity and inclusion commission for expressing unanimous support for this resolution at their regular meeting on November 22nd this year. So as we see here, there are cities and counties in the state of California that have um, adopted the res resolution in support of CEDO. And some cities and counties have gone a step further by passing ordinances in support of CEDO. There is no fiscal impact for adopting this resolution should the council decide to go ahead. So the recommendation from staff is that the city adopts a resolution in support of the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms Against of discrimination against women, CEDO. Every day, women and girls face discrimination and violence. Adopting this resolution sends a message that L Group stands with women in the fight for equality. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe we have representatives from the Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. Anybody else want to speak? Hello and thank you. My name is Tamisa Wash. I am the vice chair on the commission and Aaron Saberi, our chair, um, sends her apologies for not being able to attend tonight. And I have Jinky as well as Jatin joining us tonight. Thank you, Mayor Singh Allen um, and members of the city council. On behalf of the Sacramento County Commission on the Status of Women and Girls, we wish to thank Mayor Singh Allen for her leadership and commitment to women and girls and for bringing this resolution before you. Tonight with this resolution and recognition of the principles of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the city of Elk Grove has the opportunity to join with the majority of the nations of the world who have adopted this important framework. Tonight, the city of El Grove has also joined with the city of Sacramento and cities across California and the nation in adopting cities of CEDAW. Now, why here? Why now? With the establishment of the Sacramento County Commission on the Status of Women and Girls a couple of years ago, we have set our sights on answering a very important question. How are the women and girls? A hundred plus years since women won the right to vote and in a time when girls are more educated and have widespread access to the workforce, the answers aren't what we might expect. After decades of social and political gains, women and girls are still tra tragically unsafe in their homes and, uh, and on our streets, making less on the dollar than their male counterparts falling into poverty and homelessness at astonishing rates, particularly amongst elderly women. Women's employment among all education groups have stalled since 2020 and even more since COVID. A 2020 gender equity report about women in the United States found that on every indicator considered women's progress relative to men has slowed and in some cases, progress has stalled entirely in every case except educational attainment. A slowdown on stall has occurred and gender inequality still favors men. We recognize that these are challenging times for everyone. And in challenging times, women tend to carry a lot of the domestic and care caregiving burden in addition to their workforce responsibilities. 
The onset of COVID-19 in particular has highlighted the need for a gender lens on social services because women have borne the brunt of the economic and health downturn. What will CDAO accomplish? It provides an opportunity for dialogue on how to address persistent issues. It can provide an opportunity to look at your budget and your local policy. For example, in San Francisco, when the police and DV organizations got together to look at women's safety, they discovered something as simple as putting new lighting next to bus stops helped reduce crime at night for women who helped who worked night shifts, sometimes looking at issues through the eyes of women's experiences can lead us to simple policy solutions. So what are our next steps? We look forward to working with you to advance awareness and understanding of CDAO to hopefully work towards an ordinance to support your continued commitment to DEI in City of Elk Grove. Today, we thank you again for your time attention and commitment to women and girls. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Are you Okay, at this time, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm gonna open up the public comment opportunity. I have one person signed up, uh, Kirk Thompson. Well, um, <clears throat> now that I've heard the presentation, I actually am rising to support this resolution. <laughs> Um, I, however, you know, red flags always pop into my mind when I see resolutions like this, especially since I became a girl dad. So I'm, I always kind of take a extra look at these things. Now, this probably also has to do that, um, you know, I fear as, uh, as, uh, Ronald Reagan said when he was speaking out against the equal rights amendment, that this could be used by mischievous men, uh, to eliminate proper discriminations that women absolutely deserve based on physical differences and, differences they make in choices that are, you know, obviously dif difference between genders. So I do have a couple of questions, and a, uh, I'm more wondering, is there going to be any kind of like, is there like a legal binding to this resolution? That's number one. Or is this just more aspirational? Because, you know, I obviously want to, I want this town to keep striving towards that, the goal that women, like my daughter someday will be, um, they'll always be able to have the same opportunity that a man has, you know, no matter what uh, path they choose, whether it's homemaker or CEO or mayor. So, um, so that's really it. I want to make sure that we are, you know, this is a positive uh, advancement for women, not something that can be made bad down the road. So, Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Uh, Kirk was the only person signed up for public um, <laughs> comment. So I will go ahead and close the public comment opportunity. And um, I'll start with my right. Any comments or questions uh, before we take our formal vote? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to say thank you for presenting this. Um, growing up, you know, coming from a single parent household where my mother was the main one who pushed us forward, having two nieces who are women, um, I'm proud to say that Elk Grove stands with women and we're standing to ending discrimination. Um, I am beyond proud and I'm honored to be able to, to cast this vote, to pass this resolution. Is that a motion in there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard yes. I think that is a motion. Hi, Mayor, what do you have to say? Hi, Tamisha, how are you? <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is a great resolution. It's one of those it's one of those resolutions that when you read it and you understand it, um, it makes perfect sense. Especially for myself, growing up with a widowed mother, surrounded by a lot of women that helped raise me, continue to raise me to this day. Um, it's 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 a it's fundamental um, for us um, from a humanistic standpoint to really do what we can to be advocates for equal rights for men and women, especially women across the board. Because not only have we seen um, stories, some cases we even seen them up close of, of the discrimination, the brutality, the horrors that come with this notion that 
um, men are on top and women are, are on bottom. And, we, and it takes for several generations, but also takes for a lot of us, whether we are uncles or fathers, to really aspire to keep us on a pace where we are all seeing our sons and daughters, nephews and nieces equal, so we can prosper towards that shining star on the hill. It's very important that, that, that we be, be mindful of that. And this resolution helps us um, not only look at it from here at home, but, to, but abroad, globally. And I, I applaud the mayor for bringing this up. I applaud you all up here for coming up here and, and, and providing your presentation because it's important for us to have these ideals, not only in, in the back of our mind, but in the front of our minds and wear, and wear them on our sleeves every day. So on that, I would second it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll continue on here. We'll go to Council Member Kevin Spieth. I almost said Vice Mayor. Hey, it's a hard <laughs> habit to break. It too. It's a hard yeah, habit to break. Um, you know, it, it's uh, we're in. Well, we're almost in 2024. It's it's unfortunate that uh, the resolution is necessary, right? We you thought we would have figured this out long ago. Uh, Dr. Femi, thank you so much for for uh, the presentation. I always enjoy um, having you. Um, understand um, important points like this. We've had a number of conversations and I, and I, and I value that. You know, as a, as a Rotarian, um, our club here in the area, some people may be asking, well, what is this? Why, why do we have to talk about this here? What is, you know, we have, we have equality, we have this, right? One, it's not equal everywhere in the world, but there also is issues, particularly that you brought up, relative to uh, human trafficking. As a Rotarian, we're, we're you know, uh, devoted to uh, helping to end human trafficking. So if you're looking for an example, a very clear example for um, uh, how there's still inequities relative to that is is through is looking at human trafficking. Um, it happens every day. And sadly, it happens right here. So um, thank you very much uh, for bringing it forward, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you uh, again, Dr. Femi, and thank you very much uh, for those of you who are on the, the um, committee. Um, and uh, so I'll definitely support tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor. Council Member Darren Soon. Thank you, Mayor. Also, I uh, want to follow in, in uh, similar uh, sentiments as my colleagues, and, and thank you to the Mayor for bringing this forward, and all of you uh, for continuing the work in, in this space. It, it, you know, I'll echo uh, Council Member Spies in that, you know, why would this be needed? It's, it's unfortunate and, and really counterintuitive if you think about it. If you, if you only think of in the realms of men and women, you know, as a, as a man, I have a wife who I want to be, be treated fairly. I have uh, a mother, you know, if, if, if being, a, being a son, uh, to think of her being treated unfairly is, is not something that would sit well with me. If you have a daughter, uh, similarly, if you have a sister, similarly. So why, in that space, why would we uh, even want to go down the path of, um, of not treating uh, women fairly and equally? Um, so again, it's counterintuitive. Uh, it, Wish it wasn't needed, but I'm very uh, supportive of of this effort and uh, happy to support bringing forward. But uh, again, I want to commend all of you for your work in this to continue to advance uh, this um, this framework. And uh, with that, I, well, it's already been seconded, so mm -hmm. I'll defer back to the mayor. Thank you, and thank you um, to the commission and Council Member Lisa Kaplan from the City of Sacramento, who brought this to my attention. Um, I do want to give credit where it was due. I didn't champion this all by myself. Um, it was a collective effort of uh, amazing leaders in the community. So thank you. Um, it is definitely um, aspirational work. This is a goal that we strive towards. And to my colleague's point, it is unfortunate that we need resolutions like this. It's more unfortunate that we don't have this in the United States that is part of this. Um, but, you know, seeing what's coming up on our next item agenda on 4.2 with the Family Justice Center, giving a report on domestic violence and human trafficking, this is a reminder of why this is important. Um, growing, you know, as a woman, as an immigrant woman, I, I know what the, what the inequities look like from a variety of lenses, including as a woman, fighting for equal access to resources, Women in the business world don't have the same access to resources. In the education world, 
even in honors classes as a former school board member, women, young girls, don't sign up for those honors courses. It's disproportionate. They're not encouraged or pushed to seek careers in, um, in science and engineering and some of these things. Um, so I've seen it up close and personal. The reality is we still have patriarchy and misogyny out there in the world. We still don't have equal pay. So we as a collective, as a community, we want to remind what our aspirations are, what our goals are. And I am proud of the work that our Diversity Inclusion Commission has done to bring this um, also forward because you were also part of that stakeholder um, engagement. And this provides that extra layer of resources and tools and a lens as a city through the work that we do. I'm proud of the work that we have already done, but you know these are the values and the goals that we have clearly outlined. Those become additional tools that we can use so that we can continue to be a better city, an inclusive city that is welcoming to all. So I'm just proud that all of you brought this to the city of Elk Grove's attention. Thank you for your continuous advocacy and thanking also Supervisor Cerna for creating this commission um, a few years back. So with that, I do um, hear a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, next up is item 4.2. Presentation by the Sacramento Regional Family Justice Center, Elk Grove Domestic Violence and Human Trafficking Update. Thank you. Welcome, dear friend. Thank you so much. We appreciate, hi, you. hi you guys. We hi. appreciate, hi. <laughs> I haven't met a couple of you, but hi. You guys. Um, my name is Faith Whitmore. I'm the CEO of the Sacramento Regional Family Justice Center and my colleague and Deputy Director Joyce Ballou. So we'll share this. We know that you have a very full agenda. So we're going to either skip a little bit or we're going to talk fast because we want to honor your time. Sure. But this is such an important um, topic because it does affect all of us. I've often said uh, that everyone knows someone who's been affected by domestic violence, whether they know it or not. And so we are here to speak about domestic violence and human trafficking. It's interesting to note that uh, as far, it, in terms of human trafficking, which was just mentioned, that we started the um, first, and actually it's the only 24-7 um, hotline for human trafficking in Sacramento County. We've received over, what, 2,000 calls uh, in the last 18 months. So that tells you, gives you an idea. Uh, it's not just people who have been trafficked, but it's also their families. It's been law enforcement who's called. The FBI has used us as a resource because it's a huge, huge issue. So we do domestic violence, human trafficking, elder abuse. 13% of the people we serve are elders. That's another, I think, alarming statistic. Uh, sexual assault and child abuse. Do I know how to work uh, this? Ms. Whitmore, actually, if uh, at the bottom of the podium, there's a slide out that has a keyboard. Oh, yeah. And I think if you'll see the arrow keys on the far right, that'll help you navigate. Uh, Is that better? If you use those keys, yeah. Sometimes those clickers don't have batteries in them, things of that nature. This comes out. Oh, this whole thing comes out, and I go like that, and it still doesn't work. <laughs> it? Push enter. Oh, there we go. Save this one? Step. Oh, this That looks pretty good. How about that? You're on to the next slide. So. Okay. So here we are. We're located across from the family courthouse in, uh, on Power End Road. These are just some of the programs that we offer, myriad numbers for each of these, beginning with case management, crisis intervention. We have trauma therapists on staff. We have support groups. We have... Um, programs including housing for DV victims. We don't have a shelter, but we have resources that we can help people get into uh, permanent housing. Human trafficking, as I said, we you'll hear that uh, one of the things that we care so deeply about that affects all of us are the kids. And so we have a program that uh, goes throughout the year for kids to be engaged because they are the collateral damage of domestic violence situations. And so we want to make sure that as much as we can, we empower them, we encourage them, we tell them that there is a future not to give up hope. Uh, and it ends with every summer a phenomenal camping experience, kind of a wilderness experience where they don't understand or they don't know that we have this whole agenda 
for empowerment and believing in themselves, believing in others, and believing in a good future for themselves. Uh, it's a, a wonderful experience for them. We have a health and wellness center. We have a hidden homicide uh, project. There's so much we could go into. I see the chief of police over here. We, we could tell you more about that. It's very interesting. And <laughs> we're developing a high-risk uh, domestic violence team. But in addition to all that, that's what I'm running through. We also do a lot in terms of training. And um, Joyce is going to talk more about that because I think that certainly impacts the communities in which we are a part. Since we opened in 2016, we've seen nearly 27,000 visits to our center. Half of those, that number, kids have been impacted. Uh, homelessness is a big issue. Lots of the people, up to 50% of the women who are homeless are there due, directly due to domestic violence and having to flee a violent situation. Uh, 3,235 have reported that they've been strangled. Now, that is, Joyce, I think we'll talk more about that as well, but that's uh, a significant number because in terms of law enforcement that we want to keep safe, those who kill law enforcement officers have a history of being stranglers. There's a direct connection, and so that's why we do a lot of the education that we do. Again, okay, here we are, the impact on children. That moves many of us. And as too many of us probably remember, just last year these three beautiful girls were killed by their father, um, it's okay for me to say because their mom has talked about it publicly, but they came to the Family Justice Center. These girls came to the Family Justice Center. They did everything they could, and sometimes it still isn't enough. So we are working to try and be much more proactive to develop this high-risk team so that this never happens in our community again. So a lot of the work we do is to protect the children. I'm going to turn it over to Joyce to talk about public safety because that is so important to us as well. Good evening and happy holiday. And I like your lights around your neck. <laughs> I do want to give a shout out to the chief. Thank you, uh, Chief Davis. I'm going to share a little bit more about the police department here in a minute, how good they've been. But um, why should the city of Elk Grove care? Because the work that we do is homicide prevention. You all remember the, the mass shooting that happened right after the um, shooting of the, the children that Faith just um, shared? You know, we're all at risk for um, uh, homicide. Innocent lives are impacted not only physically or sexually or financially, but emotionally. The trauma can last a lifetime for individuals. We had a client from Elk Grove who was married to a correctional officer. She had a daughter. We were working with her. We do incredible safety planning our staff does where that's one of our best things that we do we safety planned with her we worked with her to get a restraining order to include a, a move out order for the perpetrator she wanted to go home we said let's just stay in a hotel right now until the perpetrator gets served because it wasn't safe he's threatened to kill her threatened to kill himself and whoever else was around so she agreed we got her and her child into a hotel he kept texting her, and eventually he did wind up killing himself. But I feel like, you know, he had a family too. So the impact on his family, the daughter now is left without a dad. She still loved him no matter what he was doing to her. She still had that emotional connection to her. So the impact, it impacts us all. So um, why should you care also? because we care about our law enforcement just like you do. 80% you, you uh, remember Tara O'Sullivan, she was shot and killed at the scene of a domestic violence disturbance in 2019. 80% of cop killers are, had a history of prior, 70, had a history of prior domestic violence and a history of strangulation. Um, and they had access to uh, guns increases the odds of severe injury by over 500%. 50% of cop killers previously, like I said, strangled their partners, and over 75% of women who have been killed or almost killed by their intimate partners have been previously stalked by their partner. These are some of the things that the Family Justice Center is doing for prevention. We've done um, a lot, of, we're, and we're continuing doing a lot of training on to 911 dispatchers because that's where the call comes in. So they get very little training on domestic violence. So we're training them on to, to incorporate into their conversation, into the call if it's a domestic violence, to ask these five high-risk questions. 
That way they put it into the CAD call and it goes out to the responding officer. And when the responding officer goes to the house, they know that there's maybe a weapon involved, there's a strangler, you know, whatever those high risks are, which could save the officer's life. And they can be able to get the victim into um, uh, safe services. We've done a lot of training with law enforcement on the high risk and on strangulation. We just recently did, I believe it was last month or the month before, we did some training out here at Elk Grove PD. And I have to tell you, your police department, I'm not just saying this because I'm here in Elk Grove, but they're so great. This, the data that we have for Family Justice Center, you guys have the second highest rates of uh, victims that come into our agency within the county. The first city is, of course, the city of Sacramento, but you're second. And I, I don't know if there's more domestic violence out here or they're just making more referrals to us. And I believe there's a lot of, they're making a lot of referrals to us. And there's uh, Eric, I got to give a shout out to Eric St. Germain. He is amazing. He's really good. Um, I just cannot say enough about your officers and the support that Elk Grove um, PD does for our agency, our staff, our gala. You know, they're very supportive, but they're very supportive to survivors. We work very hard in this county creating a countywide sac um, strangulation protocol. Elk Grove was on that committee with us. It was endorsed by our county. And I, there's a lot of training being done out here on strangulation. So thank you to your, your team out there. We've been doing training to health systems on strangulation and high-risk cases. We do a 56-hour training academy a couple times a year. Come January 1, since we have high rates of, um, we have high-risk cases, and the ones that we just briefly talked about were very high-risk, but there's no high-risk team. I don't know if you know this, but your um, department is going to be on our high-risk team, and it's going to um, really, I think, save lives. We're going to be able to pull people together, like law enforcement, the um, district attorney's office will be on there, parole, probation, and other individuals. And when a referral comes in for a high-risk case that meets the criteria, then we'll have the people to go out and make arrest or hold him, hold him or her in jail and really try to save lives. So we don't have to come in here and say, do you remember the mass shooting or do you remember the three children that lost their lives? So we can come in here and say all the other good things that we do. Another thing that we do prevention, like Faith said, is our camp program. We do well, this last year. We sent 30 kids to camp, and they just get to be kids for a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, for a year, <laughs> for at least a week. You know, and we measure hope in that program. There's a hope survey they take 30 days before, 30 days um, while they're in camp, and then 30 days after to see their hope scores go high. And then we continue to do things with them all month long to keep those hope scores up. So. I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you all very much for, because I could talk all night and I don't want to. I could too. I could <laughs> so. too, but we promised we wouldn't. But what we would like to do actually is invite anybody who's here watching, any of you who would like to come to the Family Justice Center, let us give you a tour, give you more of the information, find out how we can be helpful um, if we're missing any gaps or anything. So we want to thank you for this time and for the support of your city. And we know budgets are tight, but if you ever find you have some extra money, you know you could put it here to help us keep your community safe. But I really appreciate it. I also want to thank you for adopting the resolution for CEDA. Um, good job. Thank you guys so much. If you, if you do come and tour the Family Justice Center, we can guarantee you a free massage. We have a oh. massage chair. Oh, well, <laughs> let me clarify. It's a chair. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a chair. In our Health and Wellness Center, um, our staff, I want to I give a shout out because our staff works unbelievably hard all day, every day, hearing so many of these stories. I, mean, I don't think we mentioned we also have a legal team that does restraining order petitions mm -hmm. all day, every day. There's four of them. That tells you how many we have. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we did, um, we can't give raises because, you know, we're, they're paid through grants and there's just not a lot of things we can do. So anyway, we got this really state-of-the-art massage chair <laughs> so that the staff could relax, you know, and, and be cared for a little bit, open for the, for the um, clients as well. So it's not that we have masseuse there. <laughs> but any questions? Anything we can answer? Thank you. Thank you for that presentation Thank you. and all of the tremendous work that you do. I'm just mm -hmm. in awe. It's hard work and compelling work. I'm keeping protecting our children, I think, is what you said. Faith. Yeah. And, yeah. It's about the kids. Um, seeing so much those, about seeing the kids. those pictures of those children, yeah. it's, it's 
It's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Have you had a, an opportunity to connect with our community prosecutor yet, Anthony Ortiz? Mm -hmm. I think that would be a great uh, connection mm -hmm. to be had. You have? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, just the more that we can integrate um, our services and resources, mm -hmm. that, would, that, that would be great. So I'm glad to see that that work is happening. And just, again, thank you so much for what you do. It's I, our, it's I our blessing. I want to echo that as well. Thank you, Faith, for everything yeah, that thanks, you've done Richard. in and out of the community. Um, when there's time when, when government can't do the work, you do the work. When there's time when government can't go into the homes, you go into the homes. And we are super appreciative of that. Um, I've had the privilege to go to some of your galas, and there is never a dry eye um, because the impact that you make is so impactful, and you're saving lives. And unfortunately, um, <clears throat> for the three little girls, it wasn't possible, but for the future, you're impacting their lives. So I'm super appreciative of that. Thank you. It's our privilege. It's our blessing. Thank you, and thanks for what you guys do. Public service is not easy, so <laughs> kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have something? No. Oh, no I, just real quick. Okay. Um, so uh, a quick thank you as well. For, so the Family Justice Center, I, for, I first became familiar with it um, through my, particip my participation in the uh, Veterans Treatment Court, and we have a number of veterans who are going through that, and I believe it's anger management, I think, is is the course that they're most typically, typically taking from Family Justice Center. I, and actually, no, we can't take credit for that. No? Which, no? There's a course that you do for the Veterans Treatment Court. but We, we offer services to, to veterans correct. who are victims. Okay, we right. don't work with, um, you know, our for, funding doesn't allow us to work. For women with sexual trauma and... Yeah, and, okay, yeah. Right. We, we do a lot of, like, restraining orders and safety right. planning and all of that. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for your, your help in, in, uh, with the Veterans Treatment Court yeah. and such. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we go on to the next item, there was a request by the commissioners uh, on the status of women and girls to get a group photo for their newsletter. So we'll do that now so that um, you don't have to be stuck here the rest of the evening. So we'll just do it right up here. All of us okay. are requested. Did you want family justice people? Yeah, saying? family justice. I mean, whoever, this is for the Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. They asked that we take a photo. Hello. Hello. Oh, thanks for being here. I like this. Oh, thank you. I, I decided to do a little bit different. Right, right. Thank you for the work you did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is public comment. We have a few folks signed up to speak. First up is Kirk Thompson, followed by Sophia Nguyen. All right, well, I want to start with, as someone who has three amateur MMA fights under his belt, it's nice to see that El Grove is producing the future of the sport. So that was really great to see, especially a young woman. Kicks some ass. I love it. Um, so <laughs> I promise I'm not here today to talk about how our local schools are paying up to 30% more than the listed Amazon price in order to add blatantly pornographic materials to our school libraries. I'm not here to talk about today, so I won't mention it at all. 
Uh, what I am here to discuss is something more lighthearted, uh, but still culturally relevant to the city of Oak Grove. I am concerned about the lack of trick-or-treaters I had in my door on Halloween, all right, and the lack of houses who participated in trick-or-treating this year. Now, in 2019, or as I call it, 1 BC, before COVID, I was pleasantly annoyed by the number of trick-or-treaters I had because they kept interrupting my watching of the World Series and because I thought I had bought a lot of candy, but apparently I did not because I had to start rationing towards the end of the night. We now have at least two Halloweens that should be considered post-COVID, and I have not seen an uptick in trick-or-treaters back to the 2019 levels. Now, it could just be my neighborhood, and I really hope it is. My concern is that the social cohesion that we had back in 2019 is taking too long to return. Uh, more evidence of this are calls by citizens at these meetings to increase fines for fireworks around 4th of July. Now, I live with a retired Vietnam War vet. I have plenty of friends who are Iraq and Afghanistan War vets. I know that between PTSD and having skittish dogs, 4th of July can induce crippling anxiety rather than joyous patriotism. However, there is nothing more un-American than a road sign that I saw in the Bay Area last July that said, all fireworks are illegal, happy 4th of July. <clears throat> this is on top of calls by local residents for the removal of free speech rights of parents who voice particular concerns at local school board meetings. Like I said before, I am concerned that the social cohesion that was at least there on the surface in 2019 is taking too long to return. I don't think there's anything up here that anybody, anybody up here can do. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure any proactive government response would be a disaster. Uh, I guess my hope is that our local community and members of our local community that are watching this might hear my words and remember to respectfully participate in those traditions we used to love before COVID, especially trick-or-treating, 4th of July fireworks, and this time of year, put some Christmas lights up on your house, please. And um, since this will probably be, the, I think, this last meeting before Christmas, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you all. Thank you. Um, next up is Sophia Nguyen, followed by Hillary Mendonca, Jr. Hi, everyone. My name Hi. is Sophia Wing, and I stand before you today as the executive director of a remarkable organization that not only is cl close to my heart, but has been very instrumental in shaping my journey and also um, instilling a very deep commitment in me to community service. Today, I request your support for our upcoming event, the Miss Vietnam NorCal Pageant. This pageant is not just a celebration of beauty, but it is a platform that empowers and encourages women to make a positive change in our community. Our pageant, hosted by the 501c3 CPALS, is more than just a glamorous event. It is a catalyst for personal growth, cultural appreciation, and community engagement. Our mission is clear, to create leaders who are active in our community. And we're doing so by providing them with the opportunity to not only discover their inner beauty, but we're teaching them to embrace their Vietnamese culture and also learn to be role models for the younger generation. One of the key aspects I want to emphasize today is the impact our pageant has on promoting cultural diversity within the city. In today's world, it's increasingly interconnected and understanding and also celebrating diverse cultures is vital. This pageant serves as a beacon for cultural appreciation. Here we are fostering an environment where the rich tapestry of Vietnamese heritage is showcased and celebrated. Additionally, I stand before you not only as and direct, a director, but also as a testament to the transformative power of such events. As a pageant enthusiast myself, I hold the title of Miss Northern Sierra Teen 2021, Miss Teen Vietnam USA 2022, and also Miss Elk Grove Teen 2022. As a previous title holder, I firsthand experienced the positive influence these platforms can have on an, indiv an individual. Initially, I was very shy, and honestly, I wouldn't be able to be staring in front of you all today, but as I continued to participate in pageants, I was able to step out of my comfort zone and also learn to be confident in myself and what I believed in as well. It was through these experiences that I not only gained confidence, but I also discovered a passion for giving back to the community. During my time as a title holder, I actively participated in community service initiatives, such as feeding the homeless, fundraising for those in need, and also organizing events for senior citizens, especially during the pandemic as well. 
In fact, my passion for community service led me to establish my very own pageant, which I am running now. I wanted to provide women and also young girls with the opportunity to be able to build their self-confidence, and also I wanted to give them a platform to make a positive change to the community just as I did. The contestants who have competed in the past, my young girls, they always come back with my organization and they always actively volunteer. So this is why I'm so eager to um, be an advocate Thank for this cause because, um, because not only did I witness myself grow, but I saw my girls grow Thank throughout you. as well. Thank yes. you. So, Future um, mayor and governor right here. <laughs> Congratulations, thank and thank you for sharing that information. Wonderful. Um, next up is Hillary Mendonca, Jr., followed by Keith Diedrich. Hillary? Are you in the hallway? Last call for Hillary? All right, we will go on. Uh, Keith Diedrich, followed by... Ahmed Ragheb, and I apologize for the pronunciation. I know it's wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Keith Dieterich, uh, President and CEO of the Gathering Inn. You had my uh, last name perfect, which is very rare. Um, I'm here today just to uh, sing the kudos of Elk Grove. You guys simply are amazing. Uh, we have operated the winter-only sanctuary since November 1st, and I can't tell you how, what a great reception we've gotten from the community, from law enforcement. Lieutenant Templeton's been fantastic to work with. Uh, Sarah from the housing department's fantastic to work with. Doug, uh, Doug Scott, I mean, just everything that we really wanted to get done to the building. I mean, he had this can-do attitude that was refreshing. Uh, I typically don't find that with facilities people all across the country that I've been. But so, I mean, kudos. I mean, you're doing something definitely right here in Elk Grove. Uh, we've been operating uh, since November 1st. Um, we got the first person housed. Um, I have Luke's, I have Luke's picture here. I can give it to you folks. You can hand it out. He's given us permission to do that. Uh, first successful person housed out of the program. We've got about four or five housing ready. And uh, it's just been a pleasure working with you, and I felt compelled just to come here and tell you that. So thank you very much. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate you guys. Thank you for all of the great work that yeah, you're doing thank you and so sharing much. the news. I appreciate Wonderful that. update. Mr. I, still, Diedrich, I still yeah. owe you 24 hours of my, of my yeah. time, so I'm still going to come. So you, I'm, you, do, you do that. After the first of the year, things settle down a little bit. <laughs> Sounds great. Mr. Diedrich, yes. I, I'm glad you're here. Um, I want to throw some kudos back at you. I was uh, at the County Board of Supervisors meeting a while back, and during their public comment period, um, an individual got up and they said, if you want to see how to do a, a winter sanctuary homeless uh, um, uh, sanctuary, go to Elk Grove. They, the example that they are doing there is is a, is a gold standard. And I know that it should be attributed to our, our staff as well, but I thought um, you should hear that too. So thank you. Thank you, thank you so doing. much for that. I appreciate it. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a pleasure doing what I do. It's a calling. And uh, thank you for having the foresight and, and the courage to do what you did too, because those aren't easy decisions. Uh, as you all know, but uh, they're very, very worthwhile ones. And uh, Luke's a testament to that. That's the first one. We're going to get a lot more housed. Okay, okay thank you. Great. Excellent. Appreciate you guys. Excellent news. Thank yeah. you. Uh, our last speaker is Ahmed Ragheb. And please correct me on the pronunciation. I'm... Ragheb. What is it? Ragheb. 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 With a B. Sorry, bye. I'll call step. you Ahmed. Ahmed is perfect. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Bobby. Um, Really appreciate being here again. Uh, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to speak. Um, I apologize. This is an emotional topic, emotional for me, emotional for a lot of people around the globe right now. Um, and and uh, this is my hometown. This is our home. Um, so I, you know, sitting in my home office, I just decided really two hours ago to come to the city council today and to speak to everyone here. So I, I, I appreciate your time. Um, for the past almost 70 days now, we've been witnessing an ongoing onslaught, genocide, um, in a lot of people's eyes. 
Uh, more than 18,000 people have been killed until this moment in the city of Gaza. More than 1,200 citizens of Israel have also been killed. This onslaught, this ongoing genocide, um, is not sparing anyone's life. Uh, more than two-thirds of the people of Gaza that have been killed are women and children. They are blocked from humanitarian aid. They don't have access to food. The videos, I don't believe I need to show anything. All of us are witnessing this on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. It's ongoing nonstop, um, and it is breaking our heart. I actually happen to work in a company that prides itself on employing citizens of Israel and citizens of Palestine at the same time. I have a coworker that is held a hostage, and I have coworkers that have been killed on both ends of this conflict. Just yesterday, out of 193 countries, 153 voted for a complete ceasefire and for unconditional humanitarian aid to go into Gaza. Ten countries voted against it. 153 supported it. Out of those ten countries, the U.S. was one of them. And it, is, it was a very shameful act, unfortunately. And so I'm here today to request, just like many cities have passed resolutions for an immediate ceasefire, that the city of Elk Grove passes a similar resolution. We demand that the city of Elk Grove adopt a similar resolution to express the sentiment of the Elk Grove citizens um, in, in, um, when I wrote it down, um, I noted Arabs, Muslims, and Palestinians constitute sizable numbers of Elk Grove community. But I'll be honest, I don't think this is an Arab problem. I don't think this is a Palestinian problem at this point in time. It is really a humanitarian problem with all the people that have lost their lives. And we need to show our dissent to this unconditional support uh, that is going on. We need to show that we stand for humanity and we support human life and we champion human life more than anything else. And so I kindly request that the city adopt a resolution. Um, I can read out. It's really just five items, and they're very straightforward and simple. Any, uh, any human being would support them. An immediate ceasefire by all parties to end all hostilities and to begin thorough diplom diplomacy effort to seek permanent and just resolution an immediate end to all acts of terrorism and violence against civilians, unconditional release of all hostages, unrestricted delivery of humanitarian assistance, and restoration Thanks. of food, water, electricity, Thank and you. medical supplies. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you. Um, wow. Okay. Um, that concludes our public comment. We will move on to our city manager's report. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, a few items to report on. Um, volunteers, city staff, and CSD staff are preparing for holiday observances honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. next month. Uh, please consider attending the community breakfast at District 56 on Saturday, January 13th, and, and the MLK 365 March for the Dream starting at Sacramento City College on Monday, January 15th. Details and registration link for both events can be found on the city's website at MLK 365. Dot org. Um, Republic Services is currently conducting an online customer service survey for Elk Grove customers. Residents have until October 31st to participate for a chance to win a $100 bill credit. Visit the city's Facebook page for a link to that survey. Recently, the Public Works Engineering Services Division collaborated with our GIS team to create an internal GIS database to monitor privately maintained water quality devices. This database streamlines tracking, reporting, annual inspections, and compliance with permit regulations. During the December Sacramento Stormwater Quality Partnership meeting, the city's approach was acknowledged as an industry-leading practice, and engineering services staff was invited to present this innovative topic at the 2024 California Stormwater Quality Association Annual Conference. Let's see. Uh, and finally, in accordance with the city's holiday schedule, City Hall will be closed on December 22nd and 25th in observance of Christmas and December 29th and January 1st for the new year. Public safety services will operate on a normal schedule, but trash and recycling collection will operate on a holiday schedule. Collection for those residents normally scheduled on Mondays will be de delayed by a day. That service will happen on Tuesday during the weeks of Christmas and New Year's. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions the council might have. All right. Thank you for that report, sir. Any questions or comments for our city manager? 
Yes, we see one here, Vice Mayor Brewer. I wanna thank you for making the announcement for the MLK Community Breakfast, and I wanna thank um, city staff for uh, and, and, and the volunteers for working closely together to uh, making that happen. I've noticed I saw it on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and several other sites, and so definitely wanna encourage people to go to, the, go to those pages um, mm -hmm. and then click the link or the QR code for the details. Um, it promises to be a very special event this year because uh, the key focus is to come away learning something new and to be inspired as you begin the Dr. King birthday weekend. And so, so thank you for that announcement. And I also saw something in here where um, talking trash could earn residents $100. And that's and that sounds that sounds pretty interesting. I mean, looking at the entry on here and encouraging people to, if you do have Facebook, to go to that page and and conduct the survey. Um, I think that's really good because it it helps helps us and it also helps um, Republic Services, our our waste services provider, to get a good idea for what's going on and how things can be improved and and what are things we, they, that we should all be looking for to help make our services be a lot more, more effective. So I wanna thank you for, for, for both of those details. I thought that was, that was very handy. All right, thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move on to the next item, which is our consent calendar items. And Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council members, I just wanted to note that a staff memo came out on item 7.22, and that just does a clerical con uh, correction to the resolution. Uh, it was a transposed APN number, and so we just ask that when you take the consent calendar that that be incorporated into the motion. All right. Um, I will go ahead and open up the public comment opportunity. I see Ahmed signed up for this item on consent. Was that a... It just that might just be left over. Pardon on that. No. All right, That's, we're I good. want to provide the opportunity and not assume, so I don't see him here anymore. So we will, is he here? Okay, oh, oh, you're behind the screen here. Did you want to speak to on a consent item? On one of the consent calendar items? Your name just appeared here as for public comment for, no, it's probably I think, a I think that was, it just wasn't cleared off All the right, system, it wasn't clear. So. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> All good, thank you, Amit. <laughs> All right, I will go ahead and close the public comment opportunity and look for approval of the consent calendar. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. The approval of the clerk's uh, revision, correct, Vice Mayor? Yes, yeah. of course. All right, so next up is 8.1. And that is a public hearing to consider a resolution declaring the public necessity for establishing an underground utility district along Elk Grove Boulevard from School Street to Waterman Road and actions for executing an agreement, an SD-14 system enhancement agreement with Sacramento Municipal Utility District. Castro, you're a Capital Programs Division Manager. I'm here tonight to... Um, open up the public hearing to consider and consider a resolution for establishing an underground utility district along Elk Grove Boulevard from School Street to Waterman Road and authorizing the city manager to execute an SD 14 system enhancement agreement with the Sacramento Municipal Utility District in association with the Old Town Elk Grove Streetscape Phase 2 project. For a little background, the first phase of Old Town Elk Grove Boulevard Streetscape project was completed in 2006 with the western limits of Walnut Avenue along Elk Grove Boulevard to School Street on the east. Phase two of this project will begin where phase two ended near School Street and continue through to Waterman Road. The Old Town Elk Grove Streetscape phase two project is consistent with the Old Town Elk Grove special planning area and will include streetscape and infrastructure improvements, such as underground overhead utilities, new traffic signal and crosswalk at Kent Street, formalizing traffic lanes consisting of one through lane in each direction, with bike lanes and a center two-way left turn lane, enhanced landscaping and hardscape, construction of continuous sidewalk, and a new crosswalk at Porta Rosa with a rapid flashing beacon. 
The purpose of relocating existing overhead utilities to an underground joint trench is to meet the city's goals as identified in the general plan, to eliminate the visual blight by removing the unusually heavy concentration of poles and wires in the public right-of-way, allows the construction of continuous sidewalks without poles within the walkway, eliminates the potential for service disruptions caused by vehicular or storm damage to utility poles, and enhances the aesthetics and walkability of Old Town. SMUD also recognizes that underground utilities are in the public's interest and has established a system enhancement program to fund undergrounding lines that are under 69 kV. SMUD's SD14 system enhancement policy requires the establishment of an underground utility district to receive the program funding. This project will be receiving nearly $1.6 million from, um, from SMUD through this program. The city's design team has worked with SMUD to develop the underground utility district limits to ensure that each property within the district maintains services from their current providers. All existing overhead utilities within the red hatched area will be placed underground. The creation of this underground utility district can be created by resolution per the city's municipal code under chapter 12.2. Staff believes the undergrounding of utility services improves the health and safety of the public by removing obstacles for pedestrians and drivers. This underground utility district would prohibit new poles and overhead equipment in the district in the future and require underground installations only. 18 properties within the property, the proposed underground utility district will be converted from overhead to underground utility service as part of this project and at no cost to those property owners. The proposed undergrounding of utilities was included in the project scope and the current project budget along with the costs associated with the 18 properties that will be converted to underground. This project is funded with nearly $8 million in federal grants. And with that, I would like to recommend council open the public hearing and adopt the resolution as written. All right, thank you for that presentation. I will declare that the public hearing is now open and open up the public comment opportunity. I think someone might be signing up right now. All right. That would be you, Mr. Mr. Becker. Mr. Randy Becker. So we'll call you up now. Good evening, Council, outgoing Vice Mayor and incoming Vice Mayor and Council. Um, a couple things that I think needs to be addressed with this project, uh, traffic mitigation. Speed limits need to be dropped and it needs to be identified as dropped through the entire traffic uh, construction. Traffic through, uh, speed limit through there is uh, 25. I'd suggest it be dropped to 15. Along with that, there should be signs at both ends stating that through traffic should follow a detour Reason being is, is there's a lot of traffic on the east side that doesn't need to come through Old Town just to get to Highway 99. We need to alleviate as much traffic for the safety of the construction crews through this area. It's tight. All truck traffic, that includes Raley's, Bel Air, uh, any trucks going to the grocery stores, need not to take Elk Grove Boulevard through town. I drove for 33 years. A lot of people use GPS. There needs to be a sign, no, no truck traffic past Elk Grove Florin. There's got to be a mitigation, a serious one put up to, to create a safe zone, not only for the residents in the area, for those that have to travel in the area, but more so the construction. Those guys are vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else signed up? Uh, I don't see anyone else signed up for this item, so I'll go ahead and close the public comment opportunity and declare that the public hearing is now closed. Uh, I'll start to the left here. Any council comments or questions? No, no comments. I support the item. Thank you. If that's a motion, then I'll second. Yep. Sure. Thank you. 
Any questions or comments here to the right? All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, next item, 8.2. It's a public hearing to consider resolution adopting updated user fees for the Elk Grove Aquatic Center and the Center at District 56. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Lana Yoshimura, Community Event Center Manager. I am here this evening with Vanessa McGill, the Community Center Coordinator, to talk to you about District 56 user fees. So when the City Council envisioned District 56, you wanted a gathering place for the community. I'm very proud to stand here today to say that we have brought that into a reality. We are a place where people come to make memories and celebrate their occasions. We have seen very large events from illumination to holiday parties that are currently happening at the center. So we have become a very popular um, venue for different um, gatherings. As you know, the Aquatic Center opened in 2019. We have not updated our fees since 2021. The center opened in January of 2020, and we have not ever um, adjusted their fees. Since opening, these are some of the economic factors that we've faced. Um, annual inflation, as well as minimum wage increases, have severely impacted our ability to operate. Um, in addition, uh, we are now at year five for the facility and starting to look at equipment replacement. Things that are used daily, like tables and chairs, um, making sure like our pumps and motors <coughs> at aquatics are safe and functional. Those are all coming due. Usually an industry standard is year five to seven is when you start to look at those things. And so we're approaching that time. This is why we're bringing you um, looking at increasing some user fees. This was our methodology when we reviewed it. Um, we looked at our operational costs. We surveyed surrounding municipalities. And then we believe that the recommended fees are reasonable based on the industry standard of public facilities, not private facilities. Um, but it does not exceed the city's cost to operate and maintain the entire campus. I'm going to start with the Aquatic Center and then turn it over to Vanessa to talk about the center. As you know, the Aquatic Center is comprised of these three pools. We have hosted a number of very large meets, and we're going to have a very exciting summer coming to 2024, which I will talk to you about in January. CSD is the operator of the Aquatic Center via agreement with the city. CSD op um, looks at their fees annually. So in order to keep pace with their fees, I've recommended ranges. Um, so that we do not have to come back every year. I know you guys like to see me, but this is not always the best place. <laughs> <laughs> Current fees are to the left. Recommended fees are to the right. None of the fee increases that we're looking at are more than 10% of cost. When you look at um, certification classes, these are classes like lifeguard, lifeguard instructor, water safety instructor, things that certify you to become an aquatics personnel. Um, group swim lessons right now are being charged at $12 per class, so they're well within the range. Every session is four classes. Private swim lessons are now $27 per class um, and are very popular, as you can see how quickly they sign up. Looking at aquatic rentals, so aquatic rentals are per lane per hour are currently $10 for short course, which is the 25 yards, and then $15 for long course. These are the rates that are paid by our home teams, um, both the piranhas and the gators, as well as the school districts pay this. I'm asking to increase it slightly for people that are not our home team, so that gives them premium pricing for use of our facility. Looking at meets, um, our most popular meet times for a half day meet are eight hours of time, 15 hours for a full day meet. So that breaks down to about currently $200 an hour and 166 hours for a full day meet, which is, which is a bargain. <laughs> um, what we're seeing now is increasing chemical costs, heating costs, lifeguarding costs, and so we need to keep up with time, so I'm asking for a slight increase there. 
We are looking to expand our pool party offerings. So this is a revenue generating opportunity that CSD and I have discussed um, at nauseum. And what we're doing is trying to create several different layers of pool parties, one in inside, inside of the captain's quarters and outside using the canopies. And then also the possibility of just renting our recreational pool known as uh, Treasure Island, which is the two slides in the lazy river. So you could rent that for your pool party um, and would be a private event for you. So we are starting to think about different marketing ideas and different ways to raise revenue. I'm gonna turn this over to Vanessa to talk about the center. All right, so uh, the highlighted areas are the ones that I'll be referring to. Um, currently we have uh, rental areas called the main hall, the commercial kitchen, conference room, and the veterans hall. Um, we also use a three-tier system for our fees. Um, the different indicated on the slides are um, those different pricing tiers. We do provide discounted rates to our Laguna Ridge residents, our Elk Grove nonprofits, and Elk Grove residents. The tier three is for non-Elk Grove residents and any other organization. So District 56 operates seven days a week with um, peak hours being Friday through Sundays, which are our most desired. Currently, we have just two Saturdays remaining on our 2024 calendar for the main hall. Um, let's see. Um, our main hall is one of the largest banquet venues in the area. Included in our rentals are the use of our tables and chairs, which are set up prior to um, our client's arrival, AV equipment, and a D56 staff person to facilitate the re uh, reservation. The recommended fee increase uh, to the rental cost is approximately, oops, sorry, <laughs> is approximately 10% above our current rates or $25 during the peak times. Um, it is slightly less during non-peak times. Um, let's see. These prices are still within the industry standard of rental facilities surveyed, which were CSD, Citrus Heights, um, Lodi, and Folsom. Oops. That's not working. Oh, sorry. All right, so on non-peak days, which are Mondays through Thursdays, our spaces are charged at an hourly rate. And the large main hall can be divided into three smaller spaces. This option is beneficial for smaller events. Um, proposed rates is less than 10% increase over current rates to encourage more weekday or off-peak rental reservations. All right, so other smaller spaces that we have available for rent are our veterans hall and our conference room. Um, these are rented hourly when the veterans are not, the veterans organizations, organizations are not using the space. Um, both rooms are rented hourly seven days a week and the proposed increases are less than 5% of our current fees. Um, other fee recommendations include our user fee for staffing and smaller amenities. Um, rentals of our community center come with one attendant, but for larger events or those lasting until 12 a.m. midnight, we would like to require a second staff for safety as well as for event breakdown help. Any event that involves alcohol or has a large number of attendees will require um, security. The city will be going through an RFP process um, in 2024, and so this proposed rate is an estimate to cover any increase in those fees that we anticipate coming with a new um, contract. So other um, amenities the city offers at our rental facility are um, an inclu a portable bar and an arch that can be used for um, ceremonies. In surveying other facilities, I noticed that these were well below market rate. Um, the increase in cost also helps to, um, helps to recover any repairs or replacements of those items. And now I'll give it back to Lana for next steps and questions. So next steps for District 56, we are going to continue to look at ways to raise revenue. We're working with CSD, our operator at Aquatics, to expand different aquatics programs. Um, they are hosting free water demo days in April 2024. This gives people an introduction to their classes for free, so you don't have to sign up for aqua aerobics. You take a snapshot and see if you like it, and then, you know, 
gives a good idea and versus like committing to something. Mm -hmm. So that will be occurring in April. Um, we're creating increased marketing for our existing programs such as Swim for Fitness, known as Lap Swim, and Water Fitness Classes. These are two of our most popular programs at um, the Elk Grove Aquatic Center. We're partnering with community organizations to bring new clientele to the facility. What we think is like we got lost in the shuffle, you know, with COVID and people not knowing that we opened, we want to make sure that people know the Aquatic Center exists, and so we're bringing in new clientele where we can. And we're also working on a plan for weekday rentals for the center. We find that if we're, um, we're a little bit slower on a Monday or a Wednesday, so we're going to try to get people in the door, business meetings, workshops, trainings, those types of things, and that's why um, our recommendations for rates are a little bit lower on that side. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. We are very proud to be working at District 56 and creating a campus that people really enjoy. It is certainly a beautiful campus. Um, at this time, I will declare that the public hearing is now open. I do not have anyone signed up on this item. I will go ahead and close the public comment opportunity and declare the public hearing is now closed. And uh, any questions or comments? I'll start. Did I, I'll start to the left. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Lana, I just want to thank you and your team for the tremendous job you've done to, to manage this facility. Um, as you mentioned earlier, we've got a lot more interest and activity over there. Um, I heard nothing but good things from, from the residents, uh, you know, as well as how it's managed. So I just wanted you to know that and just appreciate all your good work there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and sadly, you know, with inflation... Uh, as you mentioned, the wear and tear on the facilities. And we always knew it was going to uh, be managed in a deficit, actually. So this is not a surprise, to the need to do this. So I, I hope residents understand um, that there is a need uh, to, to do this so that we don't fall further behind uh, in, in not just operations of the facility, but having to then recoup costs at steeper increases. So... Uh, I wholeheartedly uh, support this, and I move to adopt the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Spees, any questions or comments? No, I'd, I'd be happy to second it. Okay. Um, any questions or comments to the right? Go ahead, Count, uh, Vice Mayor Brewer. Hi, Lana. <laughs> Evening, Vice Mayor. I'm, I, it feels like I'm, I'm one of your, your, your biggest customers. We're happy to have you. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I really like from looking at the D56 <coughs> updates is that because they have not been changed in so long, is that um, we're creating something new to help um, to help get some help build interest and maintain interest, like the wristband early rate pass purchase and the regular rate pass purchase. By having that wristband, it, it really helps for for those who use the aquatic center on a regular basis, um, so they don't have to do the pay as you go every trip, because I think that that that, that definitely can um, save families in the in the pocketbook over the long run over the course of the summer. The tier the tiered programs from my past P CSD life. I've always been a fan of the tiered process because for those who live in and around the area, the most immediate areas of, of the aquatic center, um, they are already covering a lot of the cost of their landscaping and lighting fees. So having that lower tier as a, as a discount, so to speak, and for those who do not live within the service territory, it kind of uh, radiates out, but it creates... <coughs> a, it, it, some people say it doesn't create equity. I say it does, because what we're trying to do, especially, and you've pointed it out, is that when the aquatic center runs and District 56 as a as a complex runs, we are we're trying to break even. And yes, it's a community center, but at the same time, we are in the business of creating smiles on people's faces. And to create those smiles, you do have to charge. A cost, a fee, for the usage of the facilities, and the, and what we're asking for through this uh, mechanism is is not we're not offering a king's ransom. There's there's gradual costs that are adjusted, and they're only like ten to twenty dollars, and in some cases, 
$25, that's fair. And then I see in some cases where you're really making increases of really no more of, of a $2 change. So when you look at the percentages, it correlates, but it's really in, in the bigger picture of things. And then roughly in the neighborhood of 10 to 12%, and that's very equal. And so um, this is one of the things that I'm really glad that we were able to strike that, that balance because that's what this is about. And, and, and for us to maintain the services, to keep uh, the District 56 campus operating at a peak um, and to have it reflect what we all envision it to be so it doesn't run down over time or say, why is this place looking so run down and it's only been here for under 10 years? It prevents us from doing that and it helps us plan over the long haul. And so I really, I really like that. Um, I really appreciate uh, the partnership that we have with Kasuma CSD in this respect um, because that's one of the things when we looked at as we were looking at services to parks and reserving park, um, park uh, rents, rentals and stuff like that, we, we realized all the buildings that we have over there, they, don't, they, they, they should not be operating at a minimum to where it becomes a public detriment and a safety hazard. And that's what we're doing here. And so I really want to thank you for, uh, for this presentation. Thank your team for the work that they put in and, and helping you and helping um, Tracy Ferris over at CSD and, and her team in trying to strike that balance because I think this is really uh, for, the, for the public good because the, the, the institution is, is the, the building itself is a public benefit. And so I really appreciate us um, looking for those, for those areas of agreement and creating that benefit for the, for the community. It sounds to me that the vice mayor is going to be a wristband um, owner, so <laughs> you'll be seeing him a lot more over there. Well, we appreciate all of the revenue, so I will take it. <laughs> you know, and I think uh, what the vice mayor alluded to, we have formed a very good partnership, and I'm very proud of my team. Mm -hmm. um, and CSD and I, we work well together, and my whole goal is not to be in competition with them in right. programming. We try to be a cooperative kind of thing, and I always want to make sure that we're offering programming there that doesn't compete with their other facilities because there is more than enough activity to go around in Elk Grove. Um, you know, and I appreciate Vanessa and the rest of my team who work so hard and care so much about District 56 and how the campus looks. Um, they're out there picking up litter and walking beam windows and doing those things, um, and I could not be happier um, with my team. Thank you very much. Definitely a great team. We do have a motion and a second um, on the floor. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Item 8.3 is a series of four public hearings for annexations into community facilities districts for police services and maintenance services, as well as a street maintenance district annexation and a stormwater drainage fee annexation, as will be detailed by staff. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. I'm VJ Maceria, financial, financial analyst for the city. I'm here this evening with a presentation for proposed annexations into the city's special tax districts. The city maintains eight special tax districts, which provide funding for infrastructure or services such as police, maintenance, street maintenance, street lighting, and stormwater drainage. Annexations into the appropriate districts are typically part of new development projects approval process. The requirements are special, specific for each project and vary according to the geographic location and building use. The special taxes are subject to annual rate adjustments. On October 25th, 2023, the City Council adopted resolutions of intent to annex the project's parcels, as shown on the screen. Uh, Talos Greens Project, Grantline Construction Aggregates Production and Recycling Facility, and the remodel for Elk Grove Masonic Lodge Number 173, projects in the special tax districts and to establish tonight's public hearings. The, pup, the projects are being proposed for annexation into the following special tax districts, CFD 2003-2, Police Services, CFD 2006-1, Maintenance Services, Street Maintenance District Number 1, Zone 5, Street Maintenance, Stormwater Drainage Fee, Zone 2, 
stormwater drainage and maintenance. This is the 72nd annexation into CFD 2003-2, the 94th annexation into CFD 2006-1, the 31st annexation into Street Maintenance District 1, Zone 5, and the 64th annexation to Stormwater Drainage Fee Zone 2. This, this assessment will be, these assessments will be levied in perpetuity. The first project is Tallow Screens Project, which consists of 85 single family residential units located southeast of Bruceville Road and Bilby Road. The second project is Grant Line Construction Aggregates Production and Re Recycling Facility, which consists of 24.46 non residential acres located northwest of Grant Line Road and Waterman Road. And the last project is the remodel for Elk Grove Masonic Lodge number 173, which consists of 0 0.70 non residential acres located northwest of Elk Grove Boulevard and Waterman Road. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time and consideration. I am, I am available for any questions. All right, thank you for your presentation. At this time, I will declare the public hearing for CFD 2003-2 Annex 70 to open and open up the public comment opportunity. No one has signed up for this item, so I will close the public opportunity and <coughs> declare the public hearing for CFD 2003-2 Annex 72 is closed. <coughs> And look for a motion A1. Motion A1. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. And may I request results of the ballot tabulation, please? Of 85 possible votes, 85 affirmative votes were cast, authorizing the city of Elk Grove to levy a special tax at the rate of portion and describe. The measure passes with more than two thirds of all votes cast to the election in favor of the measure. A resolution declaring the results of the election is available for council consideration. Thank you. Motions A2 and A3. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. Next item, I will declare the public hearing for CFD 2006-1, Annex 94 open, and open up the public comment opportunity. No one signed up to speak to this matter. I will close the public comment opportunity and declare the public hearing for CFD 2006-1, Annex 94 is closed, and look for motion B1. Motion B1. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right, Dan, may I request the results of the ballot tabulation, please? Of 111 possible votes, 111 affirmative votes were cast, authorizing the city of Elk Grove to levy a special tax at the rate apportioned and described. The measure passes with more than two thirds of all votes cast in the election in favor of the measure. A resolution declaring the results of the election is available for council consideration. Motion B2 and B3. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. All right. Um, I will declare the public hearing for SMD 5-AB Annex 31 open and open up the public comment opportunity. No one is signed to speak on this matter. I will declare the public hearing for SMD 5-AB Annex 31 closed and request the clerk to provide the results of the ballot tabulation. There is no majority protest of 85 possible votes weighted according to the proportional financial obligation for the properties. 85 affirmative votes were returned. The ballots approved. The proposed assessments and the proposed inflation adjustment limits described for the parcels identified in the ballots. A resolution determining the levy assessments in the district is available for council consideration. Uh, Motion C. Can I get a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, um, I will declare the public hearing. What happened? Oh, I will declare the public hearing for SWGF Annex 64 open and open up the public comment opportunity. No one signed to speak on this. I'll declare the public hearing for SWGF Annex 64 closed and request the results of the ballot tabulation. And again, there's no majority protest of 26 possible votes weighted according to the proportional financial obligation for each property. 26 affirmative votes were returned. The ballots approved the proposed assessments and the proposed inflation adjustment limits described for the parcels identified in the ballots. A resolution determining the levy assessments in the district is available for council consideration. Motion D. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, we are now moving on to item 8.4. 
This is a public hearing to consider a resolution certifying the subsequent environmental impact report for the City of Elk Grove General Plan Amendments and update of Vehicle Miles Traveled Standards Project, adopting the findings of fact and statement of overriding considerations and adopting the mitigation monitoring and reporting program for the project, as well as a resolution adopting amendments to the general plan to incorporate the Camera Road Urban Design Study, the Livable Employment Area Community Plan, other administrative revisions, and amending the City's Transportation Analysis Guidelines. Hold on, Jason. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Christopher Jordan presenting this item for you. As Jason mentioned, we have a number of things for your consideration tonight. Uh, first and foremost are a series of amendments to the general plan uh, and amendments to the city's transportation analysis guidelines, and these require your consideration and possible certification of a subsequent environmental impact report to the general plan EIR. Um, I'll walk through the amendments briefly. They're generally in the two buckets, which Jason mentioned a moment ago. The first is the Livable Employment Area Community Plan. This was to establish a new community plan in the city within our general plan to implement the Camera Road Urban Design Study, which is an opportunity for the creation of some urban placemaking in Elk Grove and the development of a new 21st century employment uh, development area. Uh, the other portions of the amendments we'll walk through later deal, again, with the transportation plan, some regional coordination policies, the Grantline Road Precise Plan, which you saw a little over a year ago, some updates to the mitigation measures contained in the general plan EIR relative to cultural and architectural resources, and as Jason mentioned, the transportation analysis guidelines. Speak briefly on the livable employment area, or the LEA, as we've been calling it internally. Uh, this implements the Camera Road Urban Design Study, which you last saw in February of 2021. Uh, this followed council direction from a study session in uh, March of 2019, following the update to the general plan to consider potential land use changes and new vision for the south end of the city along the Camera Road corridor. The intent here was to create physical environments that support the growth of a 21st century employment opportunity and employment district. The idea being the general design work that we've been doing over the prior decade or so, uh, two decades before, had actually been really focused on a more suburban um, uh, employment district, uh, which is not something we're seeing a lot of traction for in the market at this point. There's a lot of other opportunities around the region to do that, and really what is the opportunity for Elk Grove. So the LEA promotes a series of policies and standards that would create a walkable, exciting, vibrant community with quality of life amenities that would attract and retain the best and the brightest. So adoption of the LEA would be the new community plan in the general plan. This would replace portions of the Southeast Policy Area Community Plan. We would do a swap out in those areas, so updated graphics are necessary within the SEPA Community Plan. We'd also be modifying the boundaries and extents of, and even the content of, the Sterling Meadows um, policy area and the Lent Ranch policy area as those areas are part of the project as well. I'll also highlight that within the Southeast policy area, we would be eliminating policy 5.3. For those of you that have been around a while, policy 5.3 is a policy we added in 2014 as SEPA was first being adopted, which limits land plan changes that affect employment uses, particularly office and industrial lands, limits the removal, reduction, or relocation of them, except under very specific circumstances. Um, this would also apply land uses to portions of the area south of Camera Road, which are upcoming for annexation into the city. We have one pending annexation project and expect a second one uh, next year. So this is the proposed land plan. Um, very odd shape to it, of course, uh, uh -huh. as this covers um, portions of the southeast policy area, which are here on the north side of Camera Road, which is this sort of dashed line through the middle of it. Uh, along the southern edge of the Sterling Meadows project, up the Promenade Parkway corridor, past the casino, which is this gray uh, blob here, and then up Promenade as it ultimately intersects back into Poppy Ridge Road and Lots Parkway at the north end. And then this would be the Whitelock Parkway interchange up just off the map. So why go through this process? Uh, a number of factors we've been tracking over the last several years. First off, there's been a changing nature of retail developments. A lot of us are buying things online or at a variety of storefronts that are different than what we would have done 20 or 30 years ago with Power Center Retail. So the need for that acreage along the Promenade Parkway corridor is different today than it was back when those areas were planned over a decade ago. Of course, the mall is not a thing anymore. We do have the casino out there with a different set of regulatory uh, framework to it. The changing nature of office and work is really accelerated coming out of COVID. Um, so need for these large office parks is not really a thing anymore. Um, so how can we really differentiate Elk Grove within the marketplace? 
We've studied uh, a number of case studies around the country uh, about the opportunity to do something like this, what others are doing. I got to see a couple of these actually in the DC metro area, the first one being National Landing. This is uh, in between the Pentagon and the National Airport over on the Virginia side of the river. Um, here they've gone through and done a uh, redevelopment opportunity, integrating the Virginia Route 1 through the middle of the corridor, uh, middle of the development area, bringing it down to the streetscape, integrating pedestrian and transit and bicycle facilities. Millions of square feet of office and retail uses are being planned, and nearly 7,000 residential units are coming out of the ground. Another case study, Rest in Virginia. Here, this was a master plan community from the 60s. They laid out specific area for a town center of several acres that would be based upon an urban street grid with a pedestrian-focused design. Really critical mass around retail, entertainment, and hotel uses with public domain spaces, great architecture and park facilities in a regional destination. This has been a very successful model. And in this case, um, actually, this town center piece did not start coming out of the ground until the 1990s. So there's a lot of patience on the part of the developer in the county to wait for this to come to fruition. Uh, guiding principles and key policies that are laid out in the draft for your consideration. Again, development of mixed-use pedestrian-friendly centers. Parking is right size for future uses. There's a lot of language about trying to get into eventually parking structures as an opportunity to meet that need or even reduce parking needs in this area because of the very walkable nature of it. That there's a network of parks and open spaces to serve the residents and employment needs. The integration of transit, particularly light rail, or possibly bus rapid transit, into this area as the destination along that extension into Elk Grove. Designations for bicycle facilities, a lot of on-street and off-street facilities throughout the area. And a standard of 150 intersections per square mile, which actually promotes uh, walkability within the neighborhood and creation of that uh, urban density we'd be looking for here. The land uses are based on a concept called the transect. It's an urban uh, design concept that's been around for a number of years. There'd be four designations laid out within the plan from T3R through T5, with density ranges spanning from 10 to 100 units per acre, depending upon the transect zone that you're in. And then each of these zones are laid out in the land use plan I showed you a moment ago. Camera Road Corridor itself, this is an opportunity to knit the two sides north and south together. Um, so a revised section for the streets would be the direction we'd move forward with upon adoption. Uh, we'd maintain a core four-lane facility that would provide half-mile intersection spacing as we've currently envisioned it along the corridor. But the outside lanes would move to a frontage lane condition where there'd be slip ramps or access at those major intersections that would provide opportunity for on-street parking and a pedestrian space and development to face out onto the street itself and activation of Camera Road rather than the development backing onto it and creating more of a, a large wall of development. Uh, another piece to the general plan update involves updates to our study areas. There are four of these which cover uh, potential and future annexations to the city. Primarily in the south study area is what we're looking at here. These updates would involve the inclusion of a portion of the south study area into the LEA community plan. So we've updated the activity district, the residential neighborhood district, and the open space conservation district to reflect these changes. A lot of work has gone into with the affected property owners to get to this point tonight. Um, we've been able to work out a lot of the issues that they've brought forward over the last several months. In terms of that outreach, um, in addition to those property owners, one of those property owners is the Hardesty property, which is all north of Camera Road. They've asked for a number of uh, changes, and some we've been able to include, particularly for the T5 zone, reducing the minimum allowed density there to 30 units an acre. Um, I believe a representative from the Hardesty properties here this evening may speak to that. Relative to the Wakeman property, which is south of Camera Road, closer to the 99 end, we've worked through some changes to the land plan itself and the South Study Area program um, to work through and, and meet sort of in the middle on terms of uh, how to move this area forward. I do want to highlight a couple of things of importance here. First is Senate Bill 330. This was state legislation passed a few years ago, um, which limits the ability of local agencies to rezone property or downzone property that has residential allowance to it. Essentially, if you start to uh, reduce the amount of residential development opportunity on a piece of property, through a rezone action, you have to make up for that loss somewhere else in the city. You may recall a project you saw recently, Stathos 
uh, self-storage project, which involved that. There's a process we can go through to do that. But do want to highlight that these changes tonight, if adopted, would create a little bit of a process we'd have to go through if things need to move around later. Not necessarily impossible. We'd have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. But it does create a little bit more regulatory structure as we consider those changes. Um, we'll also note that a portion of the project area is covered by a development agreement that the city has with Merlone Geyer or MH Properties for areas along Promenade Parkway. That development agreement provides a vested right to the existing general plan and zoning when the DA was created in 2001. Um, that DA is set to expire next fall, at which time these amendments, if adopted, would go into force and effect. Um, the Malone Geyer team has been part of this process. We've not heard from them in some time, but they've received notice of these hearings. Quickly on the other amendments, on the transportation plan, we've got a number of changes here relative to our transit services, the migration to SAC RT, the upcoming ACE Amtrak service station over in Laguna West, updating the light rail transit corridor based upon the changes in the LEA. We're updating the descriptions of the roadway types and the roadway sizing diagram and transportation network diagram as well. Uh, there is a correction on the sizing of Waterman Road south of Bond Road, essentially, or around the Bond Road area. This was originally supposed to be a four-lane facility as part of the changes in 2019 uh, to reduce the sizing of roadways in the rural area. This area was accidentally included as part of that uh, 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 narrowing to, four, to two lanes when it should have remained as four lanes, so we're correcting that here. We also have a new traffic model for the entire city based upon the newest regional model, and then the transportation analysis guidelines would be updated. Additionally, policies around regional coordination and our economic development activities are also updated based upon the latest work that we've been doing. Last year, you saw the Grant Line Road Precise Plan. This is the plan for the roundabouts or the intersection control within the rural area, the Sheldon Old Town area of Grant Line. This is now ability, you have the ability to adopt this in the general plan tonight because we have the environmental document. And then lastly, some of the mitigation measures in the general plan EIR need some updates relative to cultural resources and archaeological architectural resources. Um, and that's detailed out in the staff report. Uh, here's the Grant Line Road Precise Plan. Finally, an EIR was prepared for the project or a subsequent EIR. Uh, this is subsequent to the general plan EIR from 2019. And this is appropriate because this project amends the general plan. Um, in terms of process, a notice of prep was circulated in the early part of 2022, and the EIR was released June of last year, or June of this year. Comments closed over the summer, and a final EIR was prepared in August of this year. The Planning Commission, through their hearing process, did identify and direct certain changes, as well as changes staff recommended as part of the engagement process with property owners. And so a revised final EIR was prepared and made available to the Commission in November 2023 and is available in your packet tonight. Uh, there are a number of potentially significant environmental impacts. I won't go through all of these tonight, but these are substantially similar to what was found in the original general plan EIR. I will also note that this EIR is intended to be used for project level analysis and mitigation for projects within the LEA that's within the current city limits. A particular project level review will happen for the annexation projects through a separate process, but this gives us a lot of flexibility to utilize this EIR long term for future development within the LEA similar to what we've done with the Southeast policy area before. Um, on the VMT analysis, we've moved to uh, vehicle miles traveled as our basis for transportation impacts as opposed to level of service as a change mandated by state law a number of years ago. Um, we're updating the numbers for our thresholds for VMT impacts based upon the new traffic model and the land use changes. Um, you really can't compare these numbers back and forth with the existing to the proposed because they're just two different models to think of. And so with that, staff and your planning commission are recommending your certification of the subsequent EIR, adoption of the mitigation monitoring reporting program, the findings of fact and statement of overriding considerations that are part of the EIR, and then approval of the general plan amendments and amendments to the city's transportation analysis guidelines as provided in your packet. Concludes my presentation. Available for questions if you have them. All right. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Jordan. I will um, declare that the public hearing is now open and open up the public comment opportunity. I have one person signed up, Larry Larson. Good evening, Mayor Singh, members of the council. Larry Larson with Thatch and Hooper, Sacramento. Uh, we represent the Hardesty family with respect to a substantial portion of the LEA property, virtually everything west of the zoo parcel and north of Camera Road, as well as a large parcel 
that is along Poppy Ridge and Essinger near the proposed White Lock interchange. Um, we've worked hard with Christopher's staff, with city attorney's office to come to some understandings of how this procedure is gonna work long term. And they have, as he pointed out, agreed to reduce the minimum in the TR5 transect from 40 to 30, which I think provides, we think, and our office <laughs> collectively think this provides a better opportunity, especially since there is very limited large scale residential projects anywhere in the Sacramento area. Most of the ones that we're seeing even now are less than 40. There are a couple that are above that, but those are exceptions, not the rule. And the Hardesty's themselves are farmers, have been a long time. They will continue to farm this property for the foreseeable future under the right to farm ordinance. Um, Christopher <coughs> explained to us a, and pointed out in a detail at the Planning Commission how this is a long-term vision for the city, that the actual build out of this could be 20, 30 years down the road. And uh, my clients would be anxious to have a developer come to them with a vision for all of this property, but we don't expect that to happen in the foreseeable future, but we are here to express their support and for this item and wish you all a happy holiday. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. That was our final uh, public comment speaker, so I will go ahead and close the public comment opportunity and declare that the public hearing is now closed. And any questions, I'll start to the left, uh, council member soon. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I do have a question. Um, Mr. Jordan, can you pull up the slide for the camera road um, cross section? Thank you. Typical section, I was going to say. Thank you very much. So when you when I look at this, there's a, a little bit of a resemblance to Fair Oaks Boulevard, which um, personally I don't think operates very well. I was wondering maybe you could distinguish that from this future plan. Right. So um, the section of Fair Oaks Boulevard, I believe you're talking about, is just east of Howe Avenue, mm -hmm. sort of going back over towards like Lomans Plaza, yes, um, that area. So exactly. no, th there is a difference here. Um, a couple of differences, actually. One, um, in that particular case, those uh, frontage lanes are bi-directional, whereas in this case, we're proposing that they be uh, single directionals and they follow the direction of travel of the adjoining um, through lane. So as you can see here in the graphic, you see the tail lights here on this side for the two lanes that are going, you know, be this mm -hmm. either eastbound or westbound. Right. That frontage lane condition is a single travel lane going in that same direction of travel. That's one key difference to it. Okay. The other key difference uh, that's here is the nature of the access from the through lanes into the frontage lane condition. In the case of that Fair Oaks example, those are hard intersections, very similar to what we have, say, out in front of Chick-fil-A and Bubbles Car Wash, um, where you have that bi-directional nature. People are stopping there, um, and so you've got multiple directions of travel that are happening there. People actually, in those cases, there may be cases in Fair Oaks where people are trying to cut across all the lanes of travel to make the left. Right. This doesn't have that circumstance. In fact, the way this is intended is, in this case, in this, uh, with the vehicle you can see here, it's a slip ramp design, much like you'd have going on or off of a freeway, um, where the, that is a lane, single directional only, that would take you into the frontage lane. You would have to travel some distance down the frontage lane to get to the next slip ramp, that in that case would take you back onto camera. And then what happens um, is you can see here this intersection into the local street. So this would be a bi-directional street that comes out to a one lane. So as you're traveling here, you could then decide, okay, I'm going to cut into the neighborhood or go into the development area. You could go a couple blocks in, maybe just one block. There'd be a street with parallel capacity within the neighborhood that would then take you to the next intersection, again, about a, every so many feet down. And eventually you'd get back out where you could go back into a slip ramp, or you could actually meet one of the arterial roads that would then provide you with a full signalization connection at camera, that half mile intersection spacing. Okay. So similar in idea, but I think executed much more effectively than that Fair Oaks example. Yes, that sounds much better. Yeah. Thank you very much. That no helps problem. out a lot. Um, so first of all, I also want to commend you and your team for all the work that you did. That is a whole lot of 
studies, documentation. Um, there's, you know, all, all of that. I uh, really appreciate you and the, and the consultant team as well. Um, you know, I think it was, uh, well, I don't think I know. Dwight Eisenhower said, uh, plans are nothing, planning is everything. And I think this is a great example of that being flexible. You mentioned it earlier about the, the direction of retail, um, things that have, have happened, you know, telework, Zoom after post-COVID environment, um, the, the recognition uh, that what we had planned in the Southeast policy area as a large 300 acre employment center is probably not feasible going forward. And so I, I, uh, I commend you on this work. And, you know, Madam Mayor, I subbed in for you at that event with the Sacramento Bee. And one of the statistics that the Ryan uh, Lillis mentioned was that the city of Elk Grove would be the largest city in 11 states in our country. And I thought that was pretty amazing. So, uh, when you look at that, you know, nearing 180,000 people, uh, as we go from this, what was a rural to a suburban, now suburban environment, uh, where we are today, I think it makes a lot of sense for us to plan uh, for a more urbanized setting. And, and we, you know, it may seem like it, but we won't be able to grow forever. We do have boundaries. Um, I think the the people in the city of Galt would uh, very much like us to put those boundaries in place and, 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 you know, the unincorporated County as well. So my point is we're, we don't have all the space to just keep growing. And as a population, we will continue to grow. I think if we can keep doing our, our jobs, right, our kids will want to come back here new people will want to come back here. And so how do we use our lands more efficiently? And I think this is a, um, you know, a great plan to to do that, adjusting again for for the signs of the times and and what um, I think what future Elk Grove has, which I, I think is bright, and so uh, making the land more used more efficient, providing more senses of place. Uh, I I really uh, am excited about what this will bring for for the future of this city. So happy to to support it as well. Thank you very much, Councilmember Spees. Okay, uh, so recognizing that this is, you know, a, a, a long-term plan, and that the, this presentation is at a far high, higher level than a lot of the work that was done, um, I do want to I do want to drill a little bit deeper here. Um, there are there are two very important. Some people call it crisis right now, um, relative to in California, relative to the affordability of housing. And housing affordability, two different things, right? Or excuse me, affordable housing and affordability of housing, two very different things. And I would like to know if you can peel one level deeper and explain to me how this general plan amendment is going to address these topics. It's 20 to 30 years out. I would love to think that we have these problems solved by then. But if we're not planning, we're planning to fail, right? So can you help me understand how we can, where this plan addresses both of those topics? Sure. Um, so on the question of affordable housing, I think there's a number of things there. And certainly the city has a track record with the development of those. We identify those sites. We oftentimes put funding into those projects. That continues as part of this, both within this area and across the entire city uh, as a whole. So that's one piece of the puzzle. It's not the only solution to that piece of the puzzle, but it's one piece of it. To your question on having housing that is affordable, that comes down to a number of different fronts, including housing choice and housing variety. Um, what we see coming out of the market today oftentimes is uh, uh, targeted at almost the same uh, market area of you know, larger home sites, um, larger homes, um, larger family sites. These are move up housing. This is um, higher value housing. The opportunity to have a diversity, diverse set of housing options that cover a wider range of density profiles, of lot characteristics, of housing styles, um, gives us the ability to start hitting back at many of those things, including the topic of missing middle housing, that middle income, that middle density of housing between a single family on a quarter, fifth of an acre lot size versus 
those apartment complexes, 20, 30, 40 units an acre. So what we've done through this plan and up here on the slide are these transect zones. When we look at the T3R through really the T4 zone and thinking about those density ranges, starting at 10 units an acre, working our way up to 20, 30 units an acre, there's a variety of product in there that can then achieve um, those affordability opportunities because the density of the product is such and the character of the product is such that you can hit a different sort of market set, really entry-level housing opportunities, um, a whole variety of cases there. So there's actually a policy the Planning Commission uh, encouraged and asked to have included uh, last month in their final review. I think it's LEA 2.5, if my number is correct, um, that t speaks more towards promoting those housing choice, those housing opportunities. And so that would be something that staff would then work through the implementation with future projects to, okay, how do we, for these different zones, leverage that and look at those opportunities? Um, another piece I'll mention is we've been going through and doing updates to our fee programs, which are another piece of the equation. Um, you'll recall about a year ago, we updated the roadway fee and converted to a square footage-based calculation as opposed to a per lot-based calculation. And that speaks again to this, if we can start promoting and getting more of those smaller product types, we have lower fees to go uh, against them as opposed to a larger home type. Now we start to incentivize some of those conditions. So a lot of work still. This is definitely part of the process to get that affordability question answered. It is not the sole answer to it. All right. And, and to be fair, we can't bear the entire brunt of the affordable affordability of housing issue, right? There's, And I'm not going to poke at anybody else, any other agencies or anything like that. I'm saying that we have to do what we can, and I appreciate uh, your your input on that. And um, hopefully by then we've magically had it solved, right? But uh, I, I appreciate you looking forward on it. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Brewer. Yes, um, I definitely appreciate the review, and I really appreciate our conversation that we've been having on this specific uh, general plan amendment over the last few months and really want to thank you for having those conversations with um, with Mike Wakeman and and and, and Mr. Larson and the Hardesty uh, group to to work through a lot of those challenges and questions that we all had uh, because I think um, when you're doing long-term planning like this you want to make sure that everyone is in a good place so we can actually go about the process of uh, of of having a, a strong concept that will be reflective of of how we want this corridor to look um, over over the long term. Because as as all great projects begin, we they start off scaled back, baby steps, and people are, and people kind of lose their patience. But the thing that I like about this is that we're having uh, regular discussions. It's, uh, it's it, and, and one of the great things about general plan amendments that they are that they are amendments. They can be changed at any time, and it's nothing that we can hold that we should hold fast and hard to if it doesn't suit everyone's needs in the long run. So I really appreciate that uh, because because um, I because I, I, I get really excited when we talk about the concepts of where on how we want this specific corridor to look like because Elk Grove will have several different corridors that are separate, separate and distinct, but in a nice web, they all have this congruence about each other that shows you the city as a whole. You have a suburban quarter, several suburban quarters, but this one will look very, very beautiful, very different from the other corridors, but it doesn't take away from the rural aspects of it. And that's the, that's the really, um, that's a really important and attractive part of this feature. So I really want to thank you for your hard work on this and your team's hard work on this. And I see several of our um, parties here in the crowd tonight. So I want to thank you all for working and, and really, and, and calling in and sharing your perspectives and, 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 and so we could all figure it out and make it work in the long run. This is this is good stuff. Definitely support it. Thank you, Councilmember Robles. Madam Mayor, thank you, uh, Mr. Jordan. Thank you so much for this presentation. I am super excited about this because this sets a foundation for what we're going to look in the future um, as prices for housing goes higher. Right, we're having. Um, the city is growing, but we also want to attract more young professionals. And that's been one of my key things since I've been on the council. How can we provide housing options for young professionals? And how can we also provide affordable housing as um, 
uh, Council Member Spies said, and this kind of sets a roadmap to, to achieving that. The options for housing is, is something that I'm very passionate about and thankful for that. And thank you to staff for, for doing this. Again, it's not going to be overnight, but it's a right step towards the right direction where we're allowing people to either downsize, right, or live in one of these areas and then eventually buy a home here in Elk Grove so you don't have to leave the city. So this is something that we're doing. I'm in favor of it. I'm excited about it because it allows mixed use. It allows walkability. It allows diversity. And it allows a mix diverse of incomes to also come there, um, especially with telecommunication and working from home. So super excited, super supportive. Yeah. I like that enthusiasm. <laughs> um, thank you for the report. Um, I really appreciate staff taking the time to work with the Planning Commission and sort of the, the deliberate pause to go through all of the questions and meet with the stakeholders, I think, was, a, was necessary so that we can have some common ground um, in agreement. So thank you for, for doing that. Um, and then also just these livable employment areas, you know, these villages, they look, they remind me a lot of European cities, which is really nice to see where you do have that mixed use, livable, walkable, um, accessible when it comes to live, workshop, play, all in this in the same spot. What I also see in these um, plans is sort of a larger scale of what Project Elevate will offer right here in the heart of the city. So we'll get a little flavor sooner than something like this that's a little bit more long term. But, um, and that missing middle, very, very important. I, I'm hoping we see more of that sooner rather than later. And I, you know, when I, I first bought a home in the city of Elk Grove, I was working for the Nehemiah Corporation, and I think I was 28 when I became a, a first-time homeowner. And I think my house cost like 115 or $120,000. I could afford it then with, with, with my job. That we know does not exist now. And um, so I'm hoping that those opportunities have not gone away, hoping to see more of those entry-level homes. But I'm excited about this project, and um, you know, ch times change. That's just the reality. I don't think we could env have envisioned some of this 10, 15 years ago. That's just, the, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping future city councils. I, per yeah. I know I won't be here um, <laughs> as mayor, or you know, happily retired somewhere, um, and drawing breath. I hope <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> But uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful project. I think uh, it definitely captures all of the wonderful, the designs of what communities can be. So um, with that, I am looking for a motion. So um, move there's, two res uh, there's two resolutions. So I think only one motion, right? So one move. motion getting adopted both resolutions. He's very excited. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> and who's the second? Second. All right, thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, so we will, uh, we've already done 9.1, so we are going to 9.2, Chief Davis. And 9.2 is to receive information from staff and consider resolution approving the Elk Grove Police Department's military equipment report. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members, my colleagues at the city. Citizens of Elgrove, <laughs> I don't have a presentation on the military equipment, and the reason being is there hasn't been many changes, and this uh, this report will be, this is 422, but it's going to be current up to November 30th of this year, so you'll have a substantial amount of reporting as far as uh, military equipment. The changes have been in quantities, not changes as far as military equipment types and things of that nature. Brand names are the same, equipment's been upgraded, but there hasn't been any other significant changes. So with that information, my recommendation is that we adopt resolution approving the Elk Grove Police Department's military equipment report and list of equipment and renewing ordinance number 11-2022, thereby approving the military equipment funding, acquisition, and use policy. The purpose of this item is also to provide community engagement opportunity for the public to discuss and ask questions regarding the annual military equipment report and the law enforcement agency's funding, acquisition, or use of the military equipment. I also have the department policy as well as our complete list of military equipment for the community if they want to ask me any questions while I'm here. All right. Thank you, Thank you for that brevity. <laughs> um, let's see. I will open up the public comment opportunity. 
I don't see anyone signed up for this item. I'll go ahead and close the public comment opportunity and um, go to the right. Any questions or comments? Yes, Council Member Robles. No comments, but motion to approve this. Very good. Any comments, questions? All right, uh, can I get a second? Second. Oh. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. 9.3. Consider a resolution authorizing executing a contract with Jacobs Engineering Group for professional engineering surfaces for the Camera Road two lane extension I 5 to Bruceville Road project, and as well as some other actions. Hello again, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council, Christina Castro, Capital Programs Division Manager, here tonight to provide an update for camera road extension from I-5 to Bruceville Road and recommend awarding the final design contract to Jacobs Engineering. The Capital Southeast Connector has been a vision for the region prior to the incorporation of the City of Elk Grove, with the goal to ultimately connect I-5 and Highway 99 in Elk Grove to Highway 50 in El Dorado Hills. Elk Grove's portion of the connector has been divided into five separate segments. Segment A1 is the portion that I will focus on tonight, but I wanted to take this opportunity to highlight the progress that we have made to date. Both segments A2 and B1's interim designs have been constructed, with stretches from, which stretches from Bruceville Road on the west to Bradshaw Road on the, e Road on the east. Segment C through the Sheldon area has completed the roadway study with two intersections now moving into the environmental phase. As for segment A1, the Camera Road two-lane extension I-5 to Bruceville Road project proposes to extend two lanes of Camera Road west of Bruceville Road to a connection with the I-5 Hood Franklin interchange. Camera Road currently exists only between Bruceville Road and Lent Lent Ranch Parkway to the east. Modifications to the I-5 Hood Franklin interchange are included with this project. Another major structural component is the grade separated crossing at the Union Pacific Railroad tracks. Along this new roadway alignment will be a multi-use path for bike and pedestrian use. And this project will also connect Willard Parkway to Camera Road for another major connection for Elk Grove residents to reach I-5. Right of way will be secured for the project during this next phase of design as well. So I'd like to acknowledge our major partners on this project. Caltrans has been integral in the I-5 Hood Franklin interchange design. We plan to return to council with the cooperative agreement between the city and Caltrans for the interchange design, right of way and construction phases next month. Capital Southeast Connector Joint Power Authority led the way with the CEQA adoption and continues to support the city through NEPA adoption, right-of-way acquisition, and environmental mitigations. And finally, Sacramento County for their continued involvement and coordination as this project is located within their county limits. So as I mentioned before, this project has been around since before the city incorporated. In 2014, the Project Study Report, Project Development Support, or the PSRPDS, was completed. As for the environmental documents, CEQA was completed in 2018, and just over a month ago, Caltrans approved the draft project report and draft environmental assessment for this project to complete the NEPA process. To date, this project has received grant funding in the amount of $7.5 million for right-of-way and $5.6 million for design. Jacobs Engineering submitted the highest ranking proposal to the city with a comprehensive scope of work to finalize the design, including right-of-way, public outreach, grant applications, coordination with the UPRR, SMUD, and other utilities, structural design, drainage, and traffic analysis, project phasing to determination, determine the appropriate phasing for this project, and complete the final plans and specs to take the project out to bid. As you can see, this will be a significant effort over the next few years. If this res resolution is approved, Jacobs will begin working on the design immediately. The cooperative agreement with Caltrans to begin right-of-way acquisition and design work for the I-5 Hood Franklin interchange improvements will return to council for approval next month. And once the project phasing and design is more refined, we will begin seeking that grant funding and ultimately begin construction 
following the design completion. And with that, I recommend council adopt the resolution as listed. Thank you very much for your presentation. At this time, I will go ahead and open up the public comment opportunity. No one has signed up to speak on this item. I'll close the public comment opportunity and open it up for any council comments or questions. I'll look to the left, anything? Just can't wait to keep this moving forward and yeah. get it done. <laughs> so I'll, I'll move to adopt the resolution. Thank you. Thank I'll you. second it. I'll questions? second it. But I'm just super excited about this. So thank you so much for presenting. <laughs> I know he's not going to talk about it. I am because this is going to alleviate traffic and it's going to help out Elk Grove and it's going to uh, create an easier access from five all the way to 99 mm -hmm. and all the way up north. So I do know that there's always been tension when it comes to this project, but this is something that we're going to do in here in Elk Grove, and this is where uh, we're going to seek funding for this. So please let us know what we can do. We are excited to see this. We've seen members of Congress from three different districts or two different districts who are in support of this. I still get to hear um, where there is a uh, local member of Congress to see if they're in support of this, but we're looking forward. Hopefully we can get them on record. So we're all for this. Wow, you are on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, okay, thank you. We have a motion and a second and a lot of passion for this project, so uh, that's great. Thank you for your presentation. Um, it's much needed for the city of Elk Grove, uh, Elk Grove and all of our residents, yeah. and I'm sure the region will also see the benefits and also be supportive. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. We are on, what are we on, 9.4. Item 9.4 is to receive information, consider, and confirm city council appointments for two member positions and one alternate member position of the Sacramento Regional Transit District Board of Directors. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members, I'm Jason Lindgren, your city clerk. Closing out our regular uh, items will be a lot of discussion about appointments, um, and this is the first one of that series. For 9.4, this is for an open seat that has been, uh, that will show up in 2024 that's created through new law. Um, I was a bit remiss, sorry I did not include this, but the meetings for RT are on the second and fourth Mondays in the evening, and they're down uh, downtown Sacramento Regional Transit Auditorium, which might play a part in who would be available in order to serve on this board. Um, but it opens up the seat, but also it gives us an opportunity to confirm the seats that we have currently standing with RT. All right, very good. So. Um before I start making any recommendations, I will go ahead and open up the public comment opportunity. No one has signed up to speak to this. I'll close the public comment opportunity. So um, I know that there's been uh, interest from one of my board members or one of my um, colleagues here who was interested and reached out a little over a month ago on the second seat for the SACRT uh, position. And then, so let's do that one first. And so I, I'm obviously interested in reserving. So I would like to nominate um, our vice mayor to fill the second va uh, vacancy. I definitely am interested in, in doing that spot for um, for the city council on this. Um, this is something I've been re feeling really strongly about, especially knowing uh, how RT is going to um, make a further stretch into the into our city, especially and definitely where the pocket where it's going to end up um, at the zoo, which is definitely in my district, but I also have had transportation experience over the years from my years, not only working on the congressional level, but also on the state level before becoming a government relations advisor. And so in transportation is one of my strong suits. I could definitely be a, a very strong push for, uh, for our city and working with the mayor on this particular committee. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So that's my nomination for um, for that seat. So we'll just take the motion from there. Um, are we supportive of Mr. Brewer, our Vice Mayor, serving on the SAC RT board? Yes. Yeah. I see a nod. I see uh, nods. I'm supportive. I just want to acknowledge Assembly Member Stephanie Wynn for um, yes. working on this bill to get us a re more representation. Absolutely, and that thank you. That would be, that was going to be my comment. Um, much needed seat. Uh, it was created in the need for equity. And um, as the city of Sac uh, Sacramento has grown, but so have, you know, they hold four seats. The city of Elk Grove is the second most populous city in the county. And it was important in the, uh, in the name of equity and fairness to make sure that we had that additional seat. So we definitely thank and recognize Assembly Member Wynn um, for all of the hard work um, for that. Um, I'm, 
I I'm willing to forego one of my seats. Um, there was an interest expressed by one of our colleagues here, um, and that is Council Member Sergio Robles, who is interested in serving on the air quality. So I'm willing to give up my seat for that. Um, I'm, I don't recall who the alternate is offhand for air quality. Was that Actually, I think I'm the, I'm the I mean, alternate. Would you yeah. be okay serving as the alternate for that? Oh, yeah, Continue? I'm fine. Yep. Okay. So um, it's yours if you want it. Yes, thank you. I'm trying to keep on building off the excitement, so I'm just you know. Yeah, I'd be yes, really excited, I, Eric, You know, I mean, it's an important, it's an important board. Obviously, oh, absolutely. Um, these mm -hmm. air quality issues don't begin and end on different uh, city limits, so. No, absolutely. And looking forward to serving on that board. And thank you so much for allowing me um, to have this opportunity. Sure. This is all Are about you sharing. Super, super excited on this one. Super excited. Oh, just okay. Super. Well, you okay. might not be as excited if okay. I let you know that the meeting. <laughs> Is Fair the day down. after city council meetings at 9 a.m. So rise and shine. Super excited. <laughs> I'm going to have a triple we'll, shot of We'll espresso. give it to the... <laughs> so looking forward for the Americano. And then um, unless so, there's anybody else who wants any changes... Council, on, before we yes. go to further rambling uh, down this road, yeah. the, we are specifically... This item was intended for RT openings. Okay, so um, also changes to current appointments. Yeah, and so it's our the appointments for regional transit, um, but it's also the... Um, I think we could bring back an item just to confirm for any of the changes. If there are changes that are coming, we can return that at the beginning of the year. Does it need to go? Because because I thought we can do it based on recommendation. It says changes to current appointments, as I read it. I would defer to our city attorney to see well, if it's, for, it's for RT for, though specifically. So okay, all I, right, I, all right. So we're all right. So, I guess I'm not super excited. I'm just kidding. Um, so <laughs> well, can, you, when, can we talk about the other existing? Yeah, you can. It'll just come back to be confirmed later. Okay, that's, yeah, fine. that's fine. So for air quality, um, we'll bring it back at the next meeting so that you can start participating um, the next day. <laughs> um, are there any other changes? Uh, anybody interested in, in shuffling? Otherwise, my recommendation is just stay as is. Um, Councilman Spies, I haven't asked you, but you know, since I'm super excited about Cameron Road, um, if you would be willing, if you're not willing later down the road, it's okay. Um, I know that I'm an alternate for the connector, but I would also like to serve on that one. You'd like to be the primary on connector? Yeah. You mean if I don't have to go to an 8:30 meeting in yes. Rancho Cordova? Yes. Sold, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a roll today, I think. <laughs> All right. So those are the two changes. And Everyone's we'll, good with all of the other existing. We'll bring those back just to confirm them in the first meeting of January. Um, but we should be able to effectuate that, and I think we'll be able to meet the timelines for you to be able to serve right away into 2024 on those boards. Okay, very good. Um, so, are we done with that item then? I believe so. So, just confirming, <laughs> we have uh, there's a uh, lot of Mayor Singh Allen, so. Vice Mayor Brewer, as our the two. Uh, uh, Representative seats for Sacramento Regional Transit District, and then we're keeping Council Member Suen as our alternate. Yes, Excellent. thank you. Um, 9.5. That's to review City Council ad hoc committees. This review typically would happen at the November meeting, um, but due to scheduling, we've bumped this one. Uh, there hasn't been any activity of new uh, ad hocs, and so it's a review. On this process, no actions required if there's no changes. We would return in November of 2024 if there were any changes. If there are any changes to any of our boards to say to uh, dissolve any of them, we'd look for a motion in a second for that. Um, a motion to keep them as is. So, well, at first of all, let me go procedurally. I'll open up the public comment opportunity. No one has signed up. I'll close the public comment opportunity. And direction would be to keep them as is. Yeah, if there's no action, we'll return in November 2024. Okay. So and moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right. Next up, another. Okay. Let's. This is um, confirming our diversity and inclusion commission appointment. Indeed, and kind of a series of actions related to our local appointments. So it's confirming the uh, kind of the indication that was given on October twenty fifth for Jenny Rodriguez to be on the diversity and inclusion commission. There is also a resolution that's presented for an appointment to the representative of our Sacramento Yolo Mosquito and Vector Control District, Mr. Lyndon Hawkins. He did indicate that he's ready to serve for another four-year term, and that resolution is available. Resolution's part of our uh, state codes is that when it's declared that it's a vote of the council, that's why the resolution's there for that local appointment. 
Uh, I did also reach out to another one of our regional boards that we have a uh, an Elk Grove resident as a representative on the Sacramento Environmental Commission, Mr. Eric Rivero Montes informed me that he would not be seeking another term that comes up as vacant in March. And this would be a request in order to uh, initiate a recruitment for that. It would start in January and then we'd target having that uh, seat filled promptly after he vacates the seat in March. We'd have the next, uh, that first meeting in March in order to make the appointment. And the last is just the review of our local appointments list as we head into the new year. Okay, thank you. Lots going on here. Um, I will go ahead and open up the public comment opportunity. We have a number of people signed up. Um, we'll start with Jenny Rodriguez, followed by Juan Nove Novello. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. My name is Jenny Rodriguez. As you get ready to confirm my appointment with the Elk Grove Diversity and Inclusion Commission, I just wanted to express my gratitude to all of you for the opportunity to get to serve our community. As Mayor Bobby, Singh, excuse me, Bobby Allen Singh uh, mentioned, when the opportunity arose back in October, this was not the first time applying, and that persistence was key. I'm honored to be entering into a space to help promote uh, representation at all levels. As I mentioned in my last speech, I aim to be a resource and work in supporting the commission in reaching our goals with the three tenets of education, promotion, to be an ambassador, and provide council feedback. For me, diversity and inclusion is not just about our race, but our lived experiences and how we need to ensure that in the end we feel as though we belong in our beautiful city of Elk Grove. I thank you for your time and wish you all a wonderful evening and a happy holiday season. And sorry about my voice. Yeah, happy <laughs> holidays. Sounds great. <laughs> Um, next up is Juan Novello, followed by Anya Woods. Hi. Uh, good evening, members. Uh, good, good evening, members of the public. My name is Juan Novello, and I'm proudly serve as a vice president for the Sacramento Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the premier Hispanic bis a small business organization across the greater Sacramento region. <laughs> And on behalf of the Sacramento Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, my boss, Kati Rodriguez Aguirre, and our board directors, I'm here to provide you with the utmost support um, of the appointment of Ms. Jenny Rodriguez to the Diversity and Inclusion Commission. I'm not a native to Sacramento, but it's because beautiful people like Ms. Rodriguez that I call this region home. It is, it is because of leaders like Ms. Rodriguez that I have hope for more economic opportunities for everyone and more inclusive form of government. And with this appointment, I encourage you not to only provide a platform for Ms. Rodriguez um, and the other commissioners, um, but to open your hearts and to continue to build a city that is not only innovative, but also ensures that nobody is left behind. Ms. Rodriguez is a mother, a wife, a leader, and a, like a sister to me. Um, she's truly a star, um, and I'm confident that she'll continue to inspire our communities and the future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful words. Uh, next up is Anya Woods, and the last speaker is Jose Manuel Garcia. Good evening, Mayor Singh Allen, Vice Mayor Brewer, and the full council. My name is Anya Woods. I serve as a Sacramento, Sacramento County Commissioner on the Status of Women and Girls and also the Program Manager for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging for SMUD. I'm here speaking on the behalf of Jenny Rodriguez and in full support of her appointment to the DEI Commission. Jenny has proven to be such a force in the movement for equity. I'm going to just put these down. <laughs> You're way taller than me, Juan. <laughs> Uh, Jenny has proven to be a force in the movement for equity across the county and across our region, whether it be in education, whether it be for social justice, whether it be for women's rights, whether it be for environmental justice. And I just really hope that with her appointment that the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Commission will also take on the challenge to dive deep into the city of Elk Grove and all of the things that are happening around our city and in our region to fully take part in making sure that there is equitable access in all of the spaces that Jenny operates in. Uh, Jenny has taken 
a long journey through her education, and she has served not only the city, but her family and other families. And I'm just really, really proud that the commission saw in her what we all see in her, the folks that are in the streets, on the ground, a part of the movement, and that you see the value that she'll bring to the commission. So congratulations, Jenny, and just thank you for taking the time to make sure that you're appointing the right folks to these commissions to make sure that the work is being done and that the voice of the people are represented. Thank you. And the, far, the final speaker is Jose Manuel Garcia. Yeah, I'm a little taller. <laughs> <laughs> so good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Um, I don't know how to follow these two up, so I'm just going to say I fully support what they mentioned before, and I've been living here in Old Grove for seven or oh, eight years now, and I wholeheartedly endorse Jenny's appointment to the Diversity and Inclusion Commission, proving leadership and dedication to the community, welfare, and her strong advocate for fostering diversity and inclusion in Old Grove. I am confident that she will bring insight and passion to this important role, contributing significantly to the betterment of our community. So thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I believe that's the last speaker signed up, so I'll close the public comment opportunity. So for the first one, we're, uh, we are confirming Jenny Rodriguez to the Diversity and Inclusion Commission. Does that require a motion? Just concurrence of the council. Concur are we good? We're nodding concur yes. Yep, we concur. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the next one requires a motion, and that is to adopt a resolution to reappoint Lyndon Hawkins for a four-year term to the Sacramento YOLO Mosquito and Vector Control District. So moved. Yeah, second. He does a great job. Yes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. And next is authorizing a recruitment to fill one anticipated vacancy on the Sacramento Environmental Commission. So moved. So let's do that. Can, we are nodding all in affirm, uh, affirmation here. Yep. And then the local appointments list, um, the direction is uh, status quo, keep, the, keep them as is, unless there's any changes. No one's reached out, so we're good to move forward. Yeah. Yes, all right, very good. All right. Council comments, reports, and future agenda items. Madam Mayor, I just wanted to say congratulations to Ms. Rodriguez. I know that you've been here several times applying for this uh, position to be on the commission, and you have been here. This is what we want to see. This is how we want to see that <laughs> community folks want to stay engaged, not just for one time they show up. You showed up every time there was an opportunity and an availability, and ultimately you were selected. So yep. We're excited. We're excited to see this. Bring that fire that you have in the community and that passion so that we can create more diversity. Um, so thank you and good luck. Yeah, very excited to have you serve. You will definitely make the commission stronger and our city better. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So we are on the council comments, reports, and future agenda items. I'll start with uh, Councilmember Robles. Anything to report? Um, nothing to report. Councilmember or Vice Mayor Brewer. Uh, tomorrow we have our final library commission meeting for the year. Right. Excellent. Um, I already told them I won't be there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, Councilmember <laughs> Spees, anything to report? Uh, Merry Christmas, Hi. Happy New Year, yeah. and Happy Holidays. Excellent. Councilmember Suen. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, in the spirit of Councilmember Robles, I'm so excited <laughs> to report we had a SACOG board meeting held uh, earlier this year, earlier this week, and I was uh, named vice chair for oh, the, the entire board. Yeah, Vice chair. Yay. Thank you. It's, uh, Thank you. It's the first time the city of Elk Grove has ever held the, the spot. So for six well, county, 22 city region. You're the region. perfect person there, yeah. and you'll not Thank only you. represent our city, but you have an excellent approach with regionalism in mind, which is so important on boards like this. Yeah. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Very excited. Before we go, I also do want to say Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's, and may you guys have a wonderful holidays. Sorry. Are, were you going to say that? Uh, yeah. It's my uh, turn. Come on, you got to be more chance. excited. You, gotta, <laughs> I have, you know I have the Super last word. Super duper excited. <laughs> we're excited. Yes, absolutely. Again, following in the spirit of Councilmember Robles. <laughs> happy Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah, Best wishes, yes. and Happy Kwanzaa. Excellent. All encompassing. Well, I, I've had several meetings. I'll say um, SACRT, um, robust discussions on um, providing light rail to a community in Sacramento. It's been agendized for the, for the next 
uh, SACRC meeting, but uh, we've been having a lot of really good discussions. And it's a reaffirmation that some of these boards, it was, you know, I had to remind my colleagues there that we are on a regional board. And it's easy to become advocates for one's own city. And, and you should do that. But at the end of the day, it's a regional board. And so to that end, um, it's great to have folks reaffirm that mindset and do the work for the whole community. So um, that's for my report. But be I would like to adjourn um, in the memory of our former fire chief with CSD, Gerald Durr. So we will adjourn um, in his memory. May his memory be a blessing to all that knew him. And I, too, would like to wish a happy holidays to everyone. Um, I can't believe it's already been a year. It is truly a pleasure to serve with all of you, our region's finest, truly. Um, this is what, you know, I'm always proud when I go anywhere in other cities. I really cannot um, overemphasize how proud I am of our city. And it's because of my colleagues and because of our dynamic staff. We are the gold standard of how we can do great things when we work together. And that's what I, I'm so proud that all of us here are committed to a strong Elk Grove, a unified Elk Grove that, uh, that believes in cooperation and working together and has mutual respect for each other. So thank you all um, for making my job much easier. Proud, proud of our city, proud of all of you, thank you. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, all of the things. Um, have, be safe um, with the holiday season. And, you know, there are so many people that are still hurting. Let us keep them in our thoughts and our prayers. And as leaders, let us continue to do the work to help those in need as well. Thank you, everyone. With that, I enjoy.